I could get a sound check, please. All right, Doug, we can hear you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the hour of two o'clock having arrived, it is time for me to announce that this is the Santa Clara County Health and Hospital Committee uh, scheduled for 2 p.m. And uh, the first item of business is to call the meeting to order, item number one, which we do by establishing the presence of a quorum. So let me ask the clerk to please call the roll and establish the presence of a quorum. Vice Chairperson Lee. Good afternoon, President. And Chairperson Simidian. Here. All right, thank you very much. A quorum is present. Both members are present and accounted for. And uh, that brings us to item number two, which is public comment. Public comment is that portion of our agenda set aside for comment by members of the public on non-agendized items that are properly within the jurisdiction of this committee. So um, if the item is on the agenda, we'll take your comments at that uh, particular time. But if it's a non-agendized item properly within the jurisdiction of the committee, this is the time to uh, either hand in a yellow card if you're here in the chambers, or let us know uh, online if you are participating remotely. Let me turn to the clerk and see if we have any speakers under public comment. We currently do not have any speakers in the room, but we do have a virtual speaker. Say again, we do have? One virtual speaker. Let's hear moment. from that virtual speaker. Right. And under public comment, uh, it is the custom and practice of the committee to provide up to three minutes. And let's go ahead and uh, turn to that speaker. All right, the next speaker is Ken Horowitz. Uh, please accept the unmute. You'll have three minutes to speak, and the timer will start when you begin speaking. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm Dr. Ken Horowitz from your Health Advisory Commission, and I, I just want to acknowledge and send our good wishes to Mr. Rene Santiago, who's retiring from the county this month. Uh, our commission is very appreciative of his decade of service to the county and specifically to our commission for his knowledge, his courtesy, and he'll be greatly missed by the county. We wish him great speed uh, and good health in his retirement. And thank you very much. 
thank you. And uh, we'll have an opportunity to say a few more words a little later in the agenda, I feel sure. Let me confirm with the clerk that was our only speaker. We have no more requests to speak. All right. That takes us then to item number three, which is to approve the consent calendar and any changes to the committee agenda. Supervisor Lee. So moved. Supervisor Lee, I believe, is moving approval of the consent calendar as contained in our published agenda, which is items 13 through 17. And uh, I am happy to second. Let me see if we have any speakers either here in chambers or online. There are no requests to speak. Then let's call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Motion carries. All right, that takes us to a consent calendar is approved for the record. Uh, it takes us to our regular agenda where we have a number of items for discussion today. Item four is the recommendations relating to medical staff and allied health professionals. These are actions for A, B, C, and D. And uh, I believe, Doctor, you are here to present on this, yes? Yes, thank you, Supervisor Smitty. Um, Would you Harry introduce Morrison. yourself for the record loud and clear, please? Yes, I'm Dr. Harry Morrison. I'm the Enterprise President of the Medical Staff, and I'm here to present the Enterprise Medical Executive Committee report. Thank you for that. Let me turn to Supervisor Lee, see if he has any questions or comments, and if not, ask for a motion to approve. No further questions, so motion approved. Motion by Lee, second by Simidian. Let's check and see if we have any speakers either in the room or online. There are no requests to speak. Then, uh, Doctor, unless you have anything you want to share, we'll call for a roll call. Thank you. Call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. Chairperson Smidian. Aye. Motion carries. All right. That takes it. Thank you very much for being with us, Doctor. Thank you for the work you do. And let's go to item number five, which is a report from the Santa Clara Valley Healthcare. Uh, in connection with the Adult and Adolescent Sexual Assault Forensic Exam, so-called SAFE program. And uh, who am I turning to for this presentation? Thank you, Chair Simidian. Uh, present today is Andrea Rolini, who are, is our new Chief Nursing Officer for the Santa Clara Health, Valley Healthcare System. And uh, as you well know, Kim Walker from the SAFE program. Thank you both for being with us. Uh, what would you like to share? We do have the report. Yep. Can you hear and me before you share a thing, we need to get you uh, loud and clear. So let's try that again. Can you hear me now? Absolutely. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairperson Simidian and Vice Chairperson Lee. Um, my name is Kim Walker. I am the nurse manager with the Adult Adolescent SAFE program, SAFE is Sexual Assault Forensic Exam. Um, we are here with the update, um, interval six-month update uh, from our last report to you in December of 2022. You do have the report, but I wanted to highlight a couple of um, items in it. Uh, we have continued to provide uh, exams to survivors in an increasing number. We are about 18% over where we were this time last year. Um, and it is a mix of exams that we're seeing. So it's not any one type of exam or one type of survivor of another. I just wanted to clarify that because that was not in the report. I do also want to tell you that we've um, completed all the hiring and training for our coded positions and also for our per diem positions. I know there's been a lot of discussion about depth in the bench, and we are now able on a 24-7, 365 basis to have three people on at all times to respond to any location in the county. Um, we do have a core team um, that helps with operations, training, outreach, um, uh, any education to those that would be partners in our response. Uh, and then we have our staff that are doing the exams primarily as well. Um, we do do the three types of exams that we've always done, the acute exams for 12 and older. We also do an acute exam where a patient might not want to report to law enforcement in the immediate um, time frame after coming to see us or after assault. Uh, but we collect evidence, we make sure they're medically okay, and then they have some time to figure out what they want to do going forward. We also can do a medical exam with a forensic lens so that they can get their care, their medications for STI prophylaxis, and still be able to um, be in a confidential space with their services available to them. Um, we are gonna be adding two exam types this year. We're gonna be adding, um, in addition to the intimate partner strangulation exams that we've been doing with the passage of AB 2185 last year, we now have a defined domestic violence um, safe exam in the penal code. And so we will be expanding the intimate partner violence strangulation exam to include the domestic violence and a personal violence um, aspect as well. And then also suspect exams. Uh, we will be adding those to our um, services by the end of this year for law enforcement. 
Um, we also have our three response locations, and I know that there has been discussion that we would be open earlier than we already are at right now, but the, I'm happy to say that we are looking at a July 5th opening for St. Louis, so that will round out our north, central, and south locations um, for patients to come and be seen by us for our services. Um, there was a delay in that because we were waiting for the state flex waiver to be approved. That came through in May of this year, and then we're finishing the res renovations for the space, the dedicated space at St. Louis for us to um, see patients there. With that, um, those are the highlights, but you do have the report, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, I'll have some comments and questions in just a minute, uh, and then turn to Supervisor Lee, but first let me check in with our clerk to see if we have any speakers on this item, either in the chambers or online? We have no request to speak. No request to speak. All right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, forgive me, uh, Ms. Walker, Ms. Berlini, I've got some comments and questions that uh, may be a little bit uh, disparate because uh, there were lots of different pieces here. Um, first, uh, um, I thought you kind of buried the good news, Ms. Walker, which was uh, it, it just really pleased me to see the sentence on page three of the report, packet page 21, that hiring and training for all coded positions has been completed. These coded positions allow uh, SCVMC SAFE to provide 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days of coverage of on-site services for the first time in its 37 years of operation. It's kind of a big deal, isn't it? It's a big deal. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about why it's a big deal. Seriously. Uh, it's a big deal because for all of that time uh, until the last year and a half and up to right about now, uh, we've been one examiner at a time. And so if a patient came in, if three patients came in, and unfortunately there wasn't um, an examiner to take care of all three, we've had some challenges with um, being able to get to them in a timely manner. So they've had to wait longer than we would hope for an ex a survivor to wait for care after assault. But now we can respond. Uh, we've had as many as seven exams at going at the same time because we've had enough staff to be able to do that simultaneously, which is huge. Now, that has, I know that's taking place at the VMC campus, yes? Uh, no, all, through all locations. In okay, well, we haven't opened the one location yet, but it will be available uh, for that location when it's opened, we think, July 5th. Is that the plan? Yeah, July 5th. Okay, and that has been the case then in connection with the other site that's opened at Stanford, yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. That was a clarification I wanted. And presumably, uh, and, you know, as always, correct me if I misread, misunderstand, misstate, um, Presumably, the next sentence is connected to the sentence previous. The next sentence in the report is, as a result, there's the connection, response times have significantly decreased below the one-hour benchmark at all locations, and response is often under 15 minutes for survivors presenting at SCVMC. The reference to less than 15 minutes is specifically for the Valley Medical Campus, though, yes? Correct. Okay. Uh, but still, good numbers uh, at Stanford to date, and we anticipate good numbers in terms of response time in the South County, yes? Yes. Okay. Then, um, numbers that were, were troubling, uh, as I'm sure they are to everyone, uh, and uh, I thought uh, unintentionally, obviously, inadvertently, if anything, understated the case, looking at page two of six, where it talks about program activity, the report highlights the fact that, quote, the number of safe exams continues to increase. Uh, as of the end of May 2023, a total of 396 acute adolescent exams have been performed, representing an 18% increase over the same period in calendar year 2022. Now, 18% increase would be, uh, you know, certainly cause for concern, it's particularly cause for concern given that last year was the highest year on record if I am reading my charts correctly. Does that sound right to you? Yes. And uh, thank you. We, uh, we were able just uh, with your assistance before the meeting 
to pull out data and um, let me say to the whole team and to Supervisor Lee and staff and public, looking back at 2018, so just five years ago, there was an average of 33 exams per month based on the data we have for that year. This year, understanding it's a partial year, we're looking at 79 exams a month, or to put it another way, that's a 140% increase in the monthly average of exams, more than doubling the number of monthly exams over just a five-year period. So to what do we attribute that? And I picked 2018 in part because that was pre-COVID. So, um, you know, we're in a, uh, you know, a mostly post-COVID world these days, uh, January to May, which is the data we have. To what do we attribute that pretty dramatic increase over a relatively short period of time? Um, I can give educated guesses, but I can't give you specific data. Please. Um, so prior to... In looking at 2018, that was prior to us uh, starting the intimate partner violence strangulation exams. So those would not have been uh, services that we were covering in 2018. That started in 2020, um, but the numbers had still continued to increase. I think they've increased a little bit more um, quickly uh, since 2020 because of those exams. I think uh, Santa Clara County has provided space for survivors to feel comfortable, uh, more comfortable to be able to come forward and report. I also think the VAWA exams, where the patient can come in and have care, get connected to services, and wait until they're ready to um, perhaps engage in criminal justice. Um, I think that is another big one. We see a lot of patients coming in for those services. With regard to why it would be increasing, other than that, um, we just don't have the data. I, I don't have an answer for you. Well, you referenced uh, the fact that essentially we've improved the um, survivor experience, um, and it's always been my belief, and again, I, you know, I don't have what I call hard data, that if we made these locations more convenient and more familiar and just more proximate uh, to folks, that that would have uh, a, a good impact, that more folks would feel comfortable using the, the services, accessing the services. Um, if I were to just ask you anecdotally, is it your perception that the problem's gotten worse in the last five years or not? Do you have a point of view on that, understanding that you may not have data to prove it? I can definitely say that domestic violence has increased. Uh, we're seeing a lot more mm -hmm. cases, and the severity of injury is also increasing. I don't know if that has to do with COVID, but that's all we have in between you know, 2018 and now for this example. Um, but certainly we're learning more about it and we're again creating space for patients to be able to come in, get services, get connected, and also increasing awareness through our outreach so that um, healthcare providers, um, schools, uh, others that uh, would not normally be able to refer them to us can do so now. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, what I'll call improvements, upgrades uh, in services at Stanford University and their hospital, uh, that's an effort that has been underway for, I want to say, a year, year and a half at this point. Uh, are you feeling like we're at the right place, that we've sort of finally achieved what we set out to achieve all those many months ago? Yes, the space is beautiful. Um, it's dedicated, everybody is completely supportive, and they're a great partner to work with in this. Thank you. That said, and now I'm going to ask you a deliberately leading question, so here it comes. Um, given the turnover of staff, particularly in the residence halls, and the turnover of students on the campus, that's going to require ongoing efforts in terms of education, yes? And yes. outreach, thank you. Um, What can you tell us about the South County space as it's almost, almost, almost finally ready? Um, it is a dedicated space. Uh, it's generally us, that, uh, our team that has access to it, um, and then pharmacy will have access to it. So it is dedicated, private. Um, it is outside of the emergency department, so it is uh, very private with the shower, with all the amenities that you would want, um, and we're changing this space, the flooring, the color, um, the 
environment, so it is calm and supportive of the survivor. Got it. And just for those who uh, I know Supervisor Lee is aware, and uh, you certainly have focused a lot of time and attention on this distinction over the last year, year and a half, but for those who are not, the, the distinction, which is a, an important one between designated space, which is identified and designated, and dedicated space, which is exclusively set aside for these purposes, is not an unimportant one. And so when you use that word um, in passing, I wanted to make sure we stopped and didn't just let it go by in passing, because it's, it's an important distinction. Thank you. Um, I can't say thank you enough uh, to both you and Ms. Berlini and the rest of your team and to Mr. Lorenz. Uh, we've spent a lot of time and effort on this, and I think it was time and effort well spent uh, and with ultimately um, a good result under very challenging circumstances. So um, my personal appreciation and appreciation on behalf of the folks that I, we represent. Supervisor Lee, to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Supervisor uh, uh, Samidian, and, and, and you certainly have addressed many of the uh, uh, issues I want to talk about regarding the uh, exciting uh, development for the past uh, year and a half or so. That's how long we've been working, it's almost a couple of years, less than a couple of years. Uh, and I, first of all, I just want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Kim Walker for your uh, dedication on this project, uh, along with your team, uh, having uh, really uh, been phenomenal of finding Right, creating this dedicated space, uh, this remodeling and this whole project, and and having been there uh, with my team of uh, staff to see it beforehand and after to really see how much uh, has changed and what this space is going to be uh, for the future is, is certainly um, uh, one of those highlights of my last couple of years. And on this board of supervisors say, wow, this really worked. Uh, so thank you for for that. Um, and also the the fact that you're able to hire so many uh, of the of the vacant spaces, um, I just want to see what what um, lesson learned can you share with us? Because clearly we have a lot of issues about hiring this county in so many departments. Can you tell us what what kind of strategies you've used that you may be able to hire so many of these uh, important positions so quickly? Wow, that is a big question. Um, so I have to say that outside of the county. Uh, Practices for safe exam teams, um, it, we are definitely ahead of the curve um, and able to provide um, payment that is compensatory. It's, it's, it's what, the patient, what the nurses do. Um, because of the work that they do, uh, we are one of the leaders in the paying uh, structure for examiners. That has been um, huge. Uh, being able to provide a space where people can come in and do this work um, has been something that has been, people have come from other counties, they've looked from other programs. Um, we've actually um, gotten a couple of examiners, great examiners from other programs because of the reputation and the work that's done here and the support of all of you and the support of administration as well. Great. So it's, we're a little bit different than maybe just straightforward. Great. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, as mentioned, uh, early July in St. Louis, we're going to be creating such a space as well. Uh, compared to the space in Stanford, what would you say? The space is you know, pretty comparable in terms of size and uh, functionality? Definitely functionality, and it definitely has all of the um, elements that are required um, by national protocol and all of that. Um, but it is a, a smaller campus, and therefore um, space is a little bit more to premium but it has everything that the patient needs, um, similar to Stanford. Good, and early in your, your presentation, I, I heard you mention something about the, uh, the, the adding the uh, triangle exams and for domestic violence, all that, which is uh, clearly uh, important. One thing you mentioned, I, I thought you said, is suspect exams. Uh, is it true that you plan on actually examining suspects and then if, uh, using those same spaces as well or elsewhere? That's a good question, thank you. We will not be seeing the suspect at the same location as the survivor. We will go to law enforcement agencies um, to do these exams. And many of us are already trained in it. Um, and this is a state exam that has a state standard form that we use. 
similar to the rest of our exams. Right, just making sure we're not using those space for the suspect. That's all I was uh, concerned about. Yeah, yeah. But, okay, that's all I have today. But again, thank you so much for the great work. It's uh, really wonderfully uh, designed and laid out, and the execution is uh, nothing uh, no, short of miraculous in my view. So thank you very much. Thank you. Let me turn once more to the clerk and uh, check once again. Any speakers on this item? No request to speak. All right, no request to speak. Uh, that being said, Supervisor Lee, the only action here is to receive the report, and so I can get a motion to that effect. So moved. And I will second. We'll call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Smitty. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you both again, and again, thank you to the entire team, and any opportunity you have to say thank you to anybody who was help, helpful, please do. Thanks. Yeah. All right, that takes us to item number six. And item number six, of course, is a look-see at how we're doing in terms of timeline on the uh, Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Facility and um, Behavioral Health Services Center construction. And um, who's going to present on that? Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Supervisor Smitty and Supervisor Lee. Uh, Doug Koenig, Deputy Director uh, for Capital Programs. Uh, I just have two comments in addition to uh, the report that you have. Uh, first, that WebCore is making great progress. Uh, they're still uh, anticipating being ready to get the steel erector uh, on site uh, first or second week of July uh, with the hope of uh, having them complete the, the steel erection by late September or mid-October. Uh, um, the other uh, update would be that we'll be meeting with WebCore next week to discuss the compilation of the, the guaranteed maximum price, and we would anticipate bringing it back to the board at the first uh, at the first meeting in in uh, August for approval. Uh, and at this time, we would expect it to be at or below the current uh, maximum contact price. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you. Yes, I'm sure. Before we go uh, to questions and comments from members of the committee. Let me ask uh, if there are any requests to speak, the clerk. There are no requests to speak. No requests to speak, thank you very much. And Ms. Soloff, are you uh, here? There you are. We're gonna ask you to come forward and do we have the folks at Veneer available to us uh, by um, virtual relief? Hi. Good afternoon. Um, I don't believe that Anthony is on the line. I believe that he had a conflict, Not. but I can hopefully answer any questions sure. that you may have. First, uh, here's what I would tell you, and I think my office has shared this with you. The memo from Veneer uh, was so detailed and, frankly, technical that it, um, it actually um, was not uh, uh, as helpful as one might hope in terms of uh, sort of cutting to the bottom line chase. So I'm going to put it to you very directly, uh, Ms. Solov, which is, um, uh, are things on schedule? <laughs> Let's try it that way. Because that's kind of a yes, no, or mostly with some minor concerns. Uh, that I'm guessing one of you, those three answers is going to fit the occasion. Yes. Okay. And um, thank you. Uh, so we have a timeline in the report from staff, and that timeline looks realistic, I'll put it that way, uh, to you and the folks at Veneer. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's really what I wanted. I will also say um, thank you for the pictures that uh, uh, you all have been sending. Dr. Smith, I got yours, uh, and uh, Mr. Lorenz, I think you sent some as well. And um, uh, I know it's a uh, an imprecise measurement. I know sometimes very significant, important work gets done that's not visible uh, immediately, but it, it does give me some sense of, okay, uh, what's, what's happening on the site, and I think that's, a, that's helpful. Uh, I don't have any other questions about the timeline or our progress, Mr. except to ask, Mr. Koenig, did I understand that um, essentially there are some outstanding bids, and those are the ones that you all are going to be in consultation with WebCore about, and that we're going to have something that's a little closer to a final estimate in uh, August. Is that the plan? 
That's, that, that's the plan, uh, Supervisor. We, uh, we believe they've got all the bids in for all the remaining packages that have not been awarded yet. Uh, they've not submitted uh, those to us for approval yet, um, but I think they're just they're just uh, going through it and, and uh, dotting their I's and crossing their T's. Good. Uh, right. So they're they're interested in, in the actual mechanics of assembling this this GMP within the framework of the of the contract that we've got. All right. Look forward to that. Uh, and let me just pivot because I can uh, on an important issue, which is. Um, this is an opportunity uh, for me, at least, to say, um, while we're obviously excited about these beds, I'm uh, concerned, and I'm sure others are as well, uh, about the loss of inpatient psychiatric beds at Good Samaritan. Uh, Dr. Smith, anybody on your team or you uh, in a position to sort of comment on what the implications of that are? Uh, and or what, if anything, we might do to mitigate the impacts? Um, I can give a little bit of a comment and then others can join in. Um, basic answer is we've been notified that um, in August, uh, the Good Samaritan inpatient psychiatric facility, which has, I think, 18 beds and is in the mission campus um, will close. The building itself has other services that are offered there, so um, I don't think there's any interest in uh, selling the entire building. Um, we're concerned about the loss of those inpatient beds for the community, um, and obviously we'll have to be looking around to see if we can find additional locations for psychiatric inpatient or psychiatric health facility beds. Um, they're also closing their pediatric ICU, which is unrelated, but just for full, in, full information. So um, it will have an effect on the community. Um, the effect is unpredictable at this point, and we'll have to continually monitor it. All right. Anybody else have any thoughts? Mr. Rao, anything you want to offer? Um, I believe Dr. Smith uh, covered most of the points. I think the only thing I would add is um, I understand that, um, you know, San Jose Behavioral Health is also engaged in conversations um, you know, with Good Sam in terms of uh, recognizing that, um, you know, there will be um, a loss of those beds, and I think there's some conversations happening there all in right. terms of availability. Well, the timing of all this, uh, Dr. Smith uh, precludes uh, submission of a referral for our meeting coming up next week, but I just want to uh, sort of give you a heads up that when it comes time for your report, uh, if you haven't had a chance in your report to um, raise this issue, I'll probably raise it within the constraints of the Brown Act as I look down at our county council. Uh, I, I'll raise it understanding that we certainly can't take any action on a non-agendized issue, uh, but, uh, and that there'll even be some limitations on discussion, but I want to continue to sunshine it, and um, I want to use this venue and this opportunity to say, um, I, I'd like to ask you know, everyone to give some thought to what we can do about that further erosion in the number of beds. Um, I, I don't think it's something that we can just say, you know, this stuff happens, uh, so be it. Uh, I understand there's a lot that's not in our control with a provi private provider, but um, I, I did want to raise it. All right, well then, uh, as to the agendized item, which is the status of uh, work on child and adolescent psychiatric facility, let me say thank you to those who are working uh, to make this uh, go um, and stay on schedule. And um, Supervisor Lee, any comments or questions from you before I call for a motion to receive the report? Uh, no further question specifically on the project. I think it's uh, very well presented in terms of other dates. Um, I, I do want to ask uh, to maybe whether it's off agenda makes sense or uh, just a report back from um, uh, uh, 
an email from a county exec regarding the good Sam regarding how many beds we're talking about and the dates when this is going to happen. Uh, I think um, so that we have the the visibility of what 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 we are coming up for. Great, I will uh, and. You know, I think we've managed the transition uh, of uh, leadership pretty well, but uh, we're getting down to uh, the day counting here. So I'm going to look to Dr. Smith and our Chief Operating Officer, Ms. Hansen, and say, everybody good with an off-agenda report on the uh, Good Sam uh, loss of psych beds? Yes. Thank you. We'll look Thank forward you. to receiving that. Great. Thank you. All right, I have a motion by Lee and yep. a second by Simidian to receive the report, which is the only recommended action on this item, and uh, to make the request uh, a, f a formal one for an off agenda on the loss of uh, psychiatric beds at uh, Good Sam and Los Gatos. And uh, last call, do we have any speakers on this item? There are no requests to speak. All right, then call the roll, please. Vice Chairperson Lee? Aye. And Chairperson Simidian? Aye. Motion, motion carries carry. unanimously. And that takes us to item 17. And that's our public health director who is, excuse me, I misspoke, item seven. Uh, that's our public health officer who is going to give us a report relating to the status of COVID-19. Thank you. And we have just a few slides to share. This will be a brief report. Um, I think the top level is that um, most people see COVID in the rear view mirror, even though it's still lingering uh, in our community and elsewhere. And that you can mostly see in the first slide, which shows the wastewater. So all of our four sewer sheds are, um, they're in the medium, kind of dipping down towards low medium, which is wonderful. Not shown here is how this translates to severe illness and death, and our deaths are quite low, um, which, is, which is excellent. I think that Dr. Rudman um, did provide an update at the last HHC about vaccinations. There's not a lot of new, um, uh, new news uh, there since, since the last report. And um, the second slide and last slide that I have to share uh, is one you've seen many times before. And I think the top level news on this slide is that it's, it's really not changed much. Uh, the patterns have been stable for, for quite some time um, as the uh, by the, the percent of, of people by city who've received their bivalent booster. So as we look towards um, uh, really the news right now is that uh, people over 65 or with certain comorbid conditions are recommended to get another one of the bivalent boosters and the only vaccine available now is the bivalent vaccine. The, the monovalent or the one that just covered the original strain um, is not on the market uh, any longer. Happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, let me see, do we have speakers on this item? I'm checking with the clerk. We do have one virtual request to speak. And let's go ahead and give that speaker two minutes. Uh, All right. The next speaker is Uday Kapoor. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak and the timer will start when you begin speaking. Uh, sorry, actually I was uh, talking about the previous subject, which is closing of the uh, uh, Mission Oaks. I actually, uh, this is, I'm from NAMI. And I'm president of NAMI, Santa Clara County. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my uh, impression is that, you know, I actually spoke to CEO uh, Tommy uh, Griba, and she told me that the issue is that the facilities need dramatic improvement and it'll take about 14 to $15 million. And uh, so that seemed to be the central issue. Uh, Lack of staff uh, is one that has been announced, but I think that's not what I heard from her. So if we can garner enough support from people and repurpose this, loss of licensed beds uh, is very severe. You know, I had a talk with uh, the previous director of El Camino Hospital, Michael Fitzgerald, and he has many ideas uh, he used to work under Tommy Reba when she was CEO of El Camino Hospital. And there are many ideas, many uh, proposals as to how we can repurpose it. So I would urge uh, you all gentlemen to at least give it one more try to find out what we can do. Uh, you know, my son was first admitted after his psychotic break at Mission Oaks 
in, in the early 90s. And I remember that as an excellent place for support and care. So I would urge you to please give it another try. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, that was on our prior item, uh, as you just heard, but I wanted to make sure we got the information into the record uh, and i um, glad we were able to incorporate it. Then let me check again uh, whether we have any speakers on this item. There are no further requests to speak. All right, then just a couple of quick questions. If we could go back to the slide showing the take-up rate on uh, the bivalent booster city by city. Just, there we go. This is one with blue bars. Uh, Dr. Cody, when we're talking about receive the bivalent booster dose here, we're talking about people who got the initial booster uh, as of this date at least once, yes? That's correct. Thank you. For the folks who are going to go back for a second one or who are indicated, as you said, by virtue of age or condition uh, as being appropriate for a second dose, is it the same shot that they got before, the same booster? It's the same formulation. That's okay, correct. thank you. So um, whatever they got once before is what they're likely to get again. If they've already had one booster, it's just time to say, let's do that again if you fall into those categories. That's right. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, Supervisor Lee and I had earlier uh, communicated uh, with the county through our uh, board referral uh, on this issue of vaccinations being available to the general public, um, notwithstanding the decrease in demand and the decrease in take up rates and the theoretical availability through uh, other sources. My understanding is that at this point, uh, vaccinations, including boosters, are available uh, to the general public at VMC. Is that the situation? Yes, it is, Supervisor. And that we, uh, Dr. Smith and others, uh, that we had uh, funding, I think it was $400,000 of memory serves uh, in our budget, uh, which we just approved uh, to continue operations for another year in response to that referral, yes. Yes, Supervisor. The funding in the budget does provide for Valley Medical Center to continue on for the community. We've had some conversation about um, making vaccinations and or boosters, and forgive me if I'm conflating terms of art here, uh, but vaccinations and or boosters available in conjunction with uh, what we have historically offered in the way of a a flu shot program in the fall. Is that conversation still underway? Am I recalling this correctly? Yes, Supervisor. Uh, so what we were doing to, to make sure that we have a sustainable program, uh, the pharmacies um, located in a number of different locations in the county will continue to offer COVID vaccination just as we do flu shots. And at the same time, uh, we are maintaining one location that will also provide for a specific uh, um, campaigns and outreach relative to the general population uh, so that they have access as well. Um, I apologize, Mr. Lorenz. I got confused there. And um, let's pick a, pick a place where we have a clinic that has a vaccination, or excuse me, a pharmacy. Um, Sunnyvale Clinic? Is yes, there? we have a pharmacy there. That's what I thought. And we have a county clinic there? We do. Are they right now, this minute, offering COVID vaccinations or boosters to people who show up and ask? For our patients, yes, we do. For our patients, meaning not to the general public. Not to the general public. And, and I'm not looking to pick a fight here, but uh, which is to say we don't have a no wrong door policy anymore. Now we do say to people, if you're our patient, we're happy to serve. And if not, we want you to go to your provider, quote unquote, whoever that might be. We do want to encourage patients to access the COVID vaccination from their own provider. Um, but what has also been made very clear to us from yourself and the board and working with the county exec's office that we should also, as a healthcare system, continue to provide access to COVID-19 vaccine for the general public. So we have identified a number of locations geographically in the county that will be available for the general public if they're having difficulty in accessing vaccination um, at these locations. Uh, and they can go online 
schedule an appointment, and receive their vaccination from our system. So if I had thought to do that before today's meeting, I would have seen that list? Yes. Yes. Okay. And how many of them are there? Ballpark? Two, four, six, eight, twenty? Uh, I would have to get back to you on that, but I believe it's at least five locations. Okay. Um, now, this next question can't be a surprise to you. Any in the North County or West Valley uh, in District 5, the area that I represent that serves 400,000 people? Yes, uh, the Mountain View Pharmacy, uh, which of course you're familiar with, does offer the COVID and, vaccine. And that's true today, as far as we know. And there's no trick question here. I'm just trying to educate myself before. I'd have to get back to you on the, the timeline relative to implementation, uh, but we are working to ensure that it, it's readily available going forward. And readily available in this case means, again, general public as well as, quote, our patients? Yes, sir. And is there a linkage uh, with um, the flu shot program? Uh, I, and I, I saw Dr. Cody shift in her chair. I shouldn't read too <laughs> much into it. But, you know, until we were struck with COVID every fall, we went through the routine of my asking, is it time yet to get my shot? and you know, every September or October, Dr. Cody would tell me, yes, it's time, and I'd go get my shot, so. It uh, is time. It is uh, time. It, it, as we approach your system, we'll make sure that, uh, as we do every year, implement a campaign in conjunction with public health to make sure they understand where they can access their flu shots. Uh, so we are planning for that as we speak uh, so that we're ready to go in the fall. All right. Um, Forgive me for being a little bit parochial here, Supervisor Lee, but uh, so if I want to know what's possible at Mountain View, what's the easiest way for me to get that information? Should I just ask you for an off-agenda report specific to that site? Yes, Supervisor, we'd be happy to provide for that off-agenda report. Thanks, and could I ask for a timeline on that off-agenda report, Mr. Uh, Lorenz? We can have that with to you within the next 30 days. That'd be great, thank you. And um, part of the reason I'm pressing on that particular site uh, is it is, I think, unusual if not unique in that it's, it's not really part of a county clinic, it's uh, sort of a standalone enterprise on the Planned Parenthood campus in Mountain View along with a couple of clinic spaces or office spaces for specialty services there. Am I re recalling all this correctly? That is correct, Supervisor. Okay. But notwithstanding that uh, difference, distinction, uh, unusual circumstance, uh, we still think it'll be um, possible to provide both um, COVID vaccination as well as uh, flu shots there, yes? Yes, that is the plan. All right, thanks. Well, I'll look forward to that off agenda report and uh, I'll do a little bit more due diligence um, on uh, the situation. Uh, in fact, any reason I, I couldn't, shouldn't ask for a, an off-agenda report on uh, vaccinations uh, at other sites uh, other than, and, and uh, flu shot uh, program at these other sites uh, in addition to the Valley Medical Center campus, main campus? Supervisor, we will provide a report that covers both COVID-19 vaccination as well as flu vaccination, what our plans are and the availability to the public. Great. And that'll be off agenda, but, but a public document, yes? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Cody, back to you. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask this question because it came up at sidewalk office hours. Um, what is the uh, conversation around vitamin D, as in David, vitamin D, and mm -hmm. COVID-19? Uh, this was raised in... Um, I gather there's a bit of a brouhaha out there in the community about this. What's, what's the state of that conversation? So I'm happy to say I don't know about the brouhaha, but okay. I can tell you uh, what the National Institutes of Health uh, says. Um, and their conclusion after looking at a number of studies is that there is neither evidence for nor against use of vitamin D for either prevention of infection or treatment. However, there are a number of small cohort studies, sort of observational, where you just um, you know, have a group of like people and see how they do. 
people with low vitamin D levels um, do seem to have worse outcomes with a COVID infection, so more likely to be hospitalized or die. But there's not enough solid evidence to say we recommend vitamin D to either prevent or treat COVID. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me turn to Supervisor Lee, who's been leaning in, but patient, and I appreciate that. Supervisor Lee, go to it. Comments or questions? Yes. Um, welcome back, uh, Dr. Cody. Good Thank to see you, you today. Um, going back to that chart uh, of all the different cities uh, in terms of the bivalent, um, first of all, I guess I would like to commend um, Supervisor uh, Sumidian for your good work, because if you look at the eight uh, towns and cities that has the highest uh, vaccination rate on bivalents are all in your district. So whatever you're doing to your district, uh, I would like to learn so that we could do better ourselves. Uh, and uh, and uh, but you no, know, all, all just aside, honestly, I think that this is uh, also showing that the the need of uh, potentially uh, doing more outreach or potentially more. Uh, 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 availability of hours to get the word out there, uh, especially when you look at the top three of the least uh, uh, vaccinated here is exactly in South South County, Gilroy, San Martin, and Morgan Hill here. Um, so, so kind of a corollary to your question. I know the Office General Report is coming. Uh, if Paul, if you could uh, share with us what what locations do we have right now in South County that is covering those uh, cities? Is St. Louis doing that, or are we doing it over at the former DePaul um, site and Morgan Hill that we're giving more uh, vaccinations to the residents over there? So um, <clears throat> let me just start with the, an easy part, which is re regarding flu vaccine. It will be available at, of course, our Gilroy Health Center as well as at the hospital. And we'll also engage in a community-wide campaign relative to making sure people have access to the flu vaccine. Regarding COVID-19, um, our plan is to uh, provide for that at the new Morgan Hill Health Center, at the new pharmacy location there. Uh, and so we'll be readily available in the South County at that location. Um, uh, prior to that, if, if we ha haven't launched the new clinic, clinic which is we're expecting to launch in the fall. Um, if there's any delay, we will make sure it's available at the Gilroy location. So in the meantime, if people would like to get their uh, bivalent shots, where would they go in South County? Uh, so um, I am gonna confirm this as Supervisor Submitting asked uh, if it's available right now to go online to schedule your appointment um, and go to the local, to our pharmacy location. Um, so initially, as I've said, we're looking at the Gilroy, uh, but eventually it will also be available and primarily be available at the Morgan Hill Health Center. Great, thank you. So I just want to make sure that uh, information is being made available uh, also to whether through social media, whatever outreach that you normally do, uh, both uh, certainly in English but also in Spanish as well. I just want to make sure that outreach is being done. Yes, we will do that. Okay, great. Um, the uh, uh, issue of uh, these uh, upcoming vaccine, uh, people are talking about potentially having it ready in uh, the fall uh, for another dose. Uh, again, all this has just been lots of talks. I don't think there's been anything firm, right, Dr. Cody, in terms of what vaccine will be coming to the fall, or if, if there's something that will be recommended to uh, certain individuals or whatnot. Have we, have we talked about any of that? I don't have an update as to the anticipated formulation for uh, bivalent vaccine available in the fall. Right, so yeah. at this point, we really don't have any guidance to tell our residents other than the fact that we'll have to wait for the next guidance and what new formulation comes through, then we could tell them to. Well, there's, yeah, yeah. there's plenty of guidance Oh, there. sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, what, so the, you know, uh, uh, you know, pretty much everyone, regardless of age, is now uh, avail you know, um, eligible for a vaccine. Um, those who've never been vaccinated and are starting a primary series would start with a, the bivalent because that's the only one available. Correct. Um, and those who ha are older and have gotten every vaccine at the time that it's become available, there may be a different formulation in the fall. I'm not updated on, um, on, on that, but I can bring that back for next time. Great, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I know we're not meeting until August uh, and looking forward to the guidance. Uh, hopefully at that point, be more clear what the, what the word is. Um, and, and currently right now for those uh, who I believe could get, a, you say something about those who are over 65, 
uh, and those who have got pre-existing uh, conditions are eligible to get another boost of bivalent. And that's more of an honor system, right? They just show up and basically, hey, I, I'm eligible, and, and this is how they will get the vaccines. That's correct. And, and uh, we still have the vaccine dashboard up on the website, and you can see there's a tiny little blip um, after that uh, recommendation came out, but not a very large blip. So Great. there were a handful of people over 65 or with other conditions who did go and get um, uh, another bivalent booster. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the, the more morbid number in terms of deaths, I know we have a lot lower number of deaths of people are still dying of COVID, even though we have not been talking about it. How, much, how, how many deaths are we having about a month in our county right now, approximately? Um, I would have to pull that up on our website to look, but it's uh, lower than it's been in a long time. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing, I'm gonna look right now and, and tell you, uh, you know, we look, we, we show the data by week, deaths by week, I think, then in our county, we're up to somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,700 deaths overall mm -hmm. um, since the pandemic began. Um, and it will load maybe in this board chambers, the website mm -hmm. shortly. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so it looks, um, it looks like just a, uh, in the last, um, really since the end of May, you know, between one and six, five or six deaths a week. A week. Yeah. Right. I'll make yeah. a piece of, so so that's, you, the, that's the recent recent trend. Recent trend. Okay. Good. So the numbers are significantly lower, but certainly there's still people that yeah. could die from it. So it's, we still have to take it fairly seriously uh, about this, and that's why the vaccination is still uh, something that we want to you know get the word out that it's still out there, mm -hmm. and that's it's still right. free. That's Even though right. we've been hearing in the news that uh, the, that might not be free anymore in the future, but at least for the time being, it is still freely available to all residents. That's correct. Good. Okay. That's all the questions I have for now. Uh, and uh, again, thank you so much and welcome back, Dr. Cody. Thank you. All right. Then can we get a motion to receive the report? Which yes, is so moved. The, thank you, which is our only recommended action. And uh, we'll ask the minister to reflect the gracious willingness of Mr. Lorenz to provide us with the report backs uh, off agenda that uh, were requested. So, call a roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Sumidian. Aye, motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. That takes us to item number eight. And item number eight, of course, is a, a report on where things stand on our uh, efforts to establish a new West, uh, new Valley Health Center in the West Valley on the De Anza campus. And uh, this is item number eight, as I say, packet page 51 for those following along. And uh, Mr. Lorenz, would you like to begin or are we turning to Mr. Draper on the facilities and fleets side? I'll turn it over to Jeff Draper. All right, Mr. Draper, how are we doing? Doing well, sir, thank you for asking. As far as, we, as far as the uh, clinic uh, uh, feasibility study goes, the team that's doing the feasibility study has been on site. They've been monitoring traffic and you know, parking patterns. They've been analyzing different locations that uh, the, the clinic might sit. And then also comparing that with the master plan to build out an art center at the campus because the utility system will have some connections that will serve both facilities. And that's the progress that's being made. We're still supposed to finish the feasibility study in August. Um, and we're also evaluating how much of the solar system might be impacted by the placement of the clinic once, once we decide. Where Thank you. Um, let me just check comments uh, from members of the public on this one. Mr. Clark? There are no requests to speak. Thank you. Um, well, thank, uh, thank you to everybody who's, uh, who's doing the work. I have... Uh, been fascinated by the scope that's described in uh, Group 4's memorandum. Uh, and um, I have two items about which I uh, have some opinions I'd like to share and see if we could maybe uh, make a little progress. Uh, and it is as follows. The, um, the operating assumption, and it says it in very plain language, I'm looking at the uh, 
group four, uh, memorandum page two, indicates that uh, project should evaluate potential options for structured parking, including subterranean, below building, podium, and parking structure. And um, there uh, is also, I think, language uh, about parking strategies in uh, your May 31st memo. And um, if I look at the Group 4 Project Management Team PMT number one kickoff, uh, it's, um, it's, it's there again as well, I believe. And, and here's the, yeah, here we go. Project background, the study shall include replacement of removed parking spaces in addition to providing for the parking for the new facility. I wanna make sure, and if this is not the case, feel free to say so and let's see if we can make some progress on it, that we're looking at those parking needs and, re and the replacement in addition to parking for the facility use itself, but the replacement as one option, not as a uh, necessary predetermined conclusion that we're gonna need to do that. Am I reading that right? Yes, sir, you are. Okay, I wanna be very explicit, and if you need a motion, I'll make it, that, that we analyze the potential for, and, and desirability, of not doing replacement parking. Is that part of the current thinking? It's also an option. All so right. the first thing is to determine, obviously, how much impact the facility would have. And then we would rely more so on the district to make the request to whatever it is that they need to make sure that their facility continues to operate as planned. Yeah, I know, you know, this is a partnership, and in a partnership, there are gonna be different priorities among different partners. and. You know, I'm very much mindful of the fact this is a college campus and, you know, we got to be a good partner and make sure that there's adequate parking. That said, as someone who used to be part of state government, um, you know, I, I would hate to see us, I mean, one of the reasons we got the, got the call, literally and figuratively, on, hey, what about De Anza, is because there is declining enrollment at the site. And um, to the extent that there has been enrollment growth, my understanding is it's largely been online. Uh, in terms of physical body presence on the site, my understanding is that that has been in decline, that that's not just a one-time only COVID phenomenon. It also reflects demographic changes in the state as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, if someone says, well, the state makes us do it, I want to ask that our organization uh, follow up and say, really, who at the state? What's the authority at the state? Is it state statute that we have to have a certain number of parking spaces? That seems unlikely. Could be a state regulation. Could be somebody in the what we used to call the Department of State Architects. I don't know if we still call it that. Um, you know, has issued an opinion. Is that opinion binding? Is it appealable? But you know, I'm going to look to Dr. Smith here when I say, you know, careful use of taxpayer dollars during tight budget times would suggest that we not be building expensive parking structures or going subterranean at additional cost if it's not truly necessary. If it's necessary, I, I don't think you'll get resistance from people, but I wouldn't assume, I wouldn't presume, and I wouldn't take no for an answer the first two or three or four times is where I'm headed on this. Okay. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna ask you for a commitment here in our open public meeting that you will pursue uh, this issue of parking requirements and not assume that uh, just because someone says so, we have to replace those parking spaces. You have my commitment. All right, and I'll give you my commitment, which is I'll carry the same message to the electeds on that board. And again, I would assure them that if the spaces are needed, you know, they don't have to, you know, worry about me uh, trying to short uh, the educational mission of the college, quite the opposite. 
but if the spaces aren't really needed, I want us to find a way to avoid unnecessary expense because those are dollars that could be better spent on other things. Um, and then related, but a little bit different obviously, is the reference you made to solar. Um, I would just want to make sure that, again, we, we asked some questions before people assumed that something like a one-for-one -one replacement on solar was necessary or even the best practice from a sustainability standpoint. Um, you know, the technology has changed a lot in the intervening years. You know this better than I because you do the work every day. I don't. Um, but, uh, um, and I'm pretty sure you're not, you know, no one's out there sitting around saying, yeah, let's replace that dated technology with some more dated technology. Uh, but I, I think this one, again, folks shouldn't just assume or presume. So uh, I've said my piece on this, and I know you hear it loud and clear, and uh, those were the two issues where I had concerns. Um, because at you know some point, cost is an issue. And I say that as you know, a champion for the project. So, Supervisor Lee, thanks for your patience. What would you like to uh, touch on here as we uh, receive this report? No further question. I'd like to make a motion to receive the report. All right, we have a motion to receive the report. We will see you in August. Please uh, uh, have a wonderful summer, but stay on track on time. That would be our exhortation, I think. And um, we have a motion and a second, and there were no speakers, so let's call the roll. Aye, Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was item number eight, and so we're gonna move on now to item number nine. And this is the uh, update on behavioral health services implementation in the aftermath of the management audit recommendations. Is Ms. Solov still with us or not? No? Uh, on this one, um, <laughs> Dr. Smith and Mr. Rao, they, you know, I'm always a little um, perplexed on these because the management audit recommendations go initially to FGOC, if I remember correctly. But then we have sort of the follow-up conversation here as the sort of committee of jurisdiction. Um, I, I think, uh, based on the report uh, that uh, Ms. Tarao has submitted as the Director of Behavioral Health, the concern that I would raise as an ongoing concern, uh, and I know she's heard uh, about this from my office uh, on my behalf, is the question of our inability to provide timely access to care. Any comments there that you'd like to make? And I did not mean to cut you off if there's a full-blown presentation, but I don't anticipate that. Um, yes, uh, good afternoon, Chair Smitty and Supervisor And Leach. I think you need to lean in a little. Okay. Um, Sherry Torhell, Director with our Behavioral Health Services Department. Um, we, we do not have a formal presentation today, but I'm happy to um, address your question around um, timely access. Um, we continue to um, work on that as one of our strategic objectives that we've shared with the full board as part of our um, response to the public health crisis um, around uh, mental health treatment and substance use um, treatment. We are working actively with our call center to continue to um, you know, track timely access and as it pertains to specific service and access to service, we've created opportunities for direct referrals um, into those programs for which, um, you know, our beneficiaries, whether medical insured or unsponsored or uninsured, um, need access to. So that continues to be something we work on and, um, you know, we will continue to bring that forward to, um, to the full board through our um, report back on the public health crisis. All right, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Lee, I recall that this was uh, uh, an item you had a particular interest in and I think uh, specifically requested we hear back on, so let me turn to you. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, the, the report talks about the fact that this so-called budget variance, i.e. we're talking about the money that's not been spent on spent funds, it represents unmet contractual obligations but not unmet needs. So maybe Sherry, you could help uh, explain the differences between these issues and how we know that these are not unmet needs. 
Sure, um, thank you for the question, Supervisor Lee. Um, there's an italicized sentence in the report um, that refers to the full um, behavioral health contracting budget um, and the fact that the funds are still needed um, because although there are unspent funds remaining at the end of the fiscal year, um, it's due to factors such as um, you know our county contract provider sometimes being unable to hire staff in a timely manner to spend down the funds and not um, because there is a lack of behavioral health needs in the community. Um, community needs, um, you know, we measure those in several different ways, including but not limited to um, utilization of our contracted services, uh, necessary mid-year adjustments for increases or reductions, uh, consumer feedback, stakeholder feedback, I mean, our new state and federal requirements. Um, so as such, um, in our report, we're suggesting uh, that the Behavioral Health Department is not advocating to cut the unspent funds from its contracting budget um, because, as Dr. Smith has stated in previous reports, our uh, contract providers will need these funds um, when they're able to hire new staff to deliver the services that we recognize are needed in the community. And we will also need these funds to fulfill um, some of the rate changes um, in alignment with our new CalAIM regulations that take effect. Uh, July 1st um, coming up uh, very soon. Okay, now for the various uh, uh, programs, we have lots of uh, alphabet, IFSP, ACT, FACT, IHOT programs. Um, I believe the answer I got when we asked earlier in terms of how the capacity is that ACT is um, about 92% of capacity, so we still have a little bit of room. But the, all the other programs are at 100% capacity. Um, and if that's the case, do we have any plans to increase some of these capacities to serve more? Because obviously the need's still there. Yeah, so um, one of the things that we have um, engaged in with our contracting for fiscal year 24, um, the, Cal, the new CalAIM regulations allow for greater flexibility in those contracts. And so um, through the fee-for-service um, billing that we're, we are planning to implement come July 1, it actually creates more flexibility for the agencies to utilize funding to be able to provide those services more flexibi flexibly to the clients. Um, and so we're gonna be closely tracking utilization of those programs um, and working with our providers to add capacity where needed. Great, yeah, so we could continue to track it to make sure that uh, if we could, if the need is there, that we are ready, willing, and able to add capacity, especially given the fact that the funding is available, being more flexible these days uh, through CalAIM, so thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all the questions I have for this one. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you both, uh, and let me see if I can get a motion to receive the report. So moved. So motion by Lee, second by Simidian. And uh, no speakers on this item, confirming once again. So we will ask for a uh, roll call, please. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Smidian. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Motion passes unanimously. That takes us to item number 10. Uh, similar situation here with an update on the implementation of management audit recommendations. My rec recollection is we've seen this one a couple of times before, and we're just checking in again. Dr. Cody, anything you want to share? I do have uh, one uh, area I just want a little more clarity on for my own understanding. Certainly. Um, I think that the issues raised fell into three buckets. Many of issues raised we've, we've addressed because the lag between when they performed the audit and now has been, I don't know how much time, but a significant amount of time. Um, and then there's some issues that were raised where we're a collaborator more than the um, sort of key department, and then there's uh, issues that we ha that are in progress that we're working on, um, and I'm happy to talk about those, but maybe we just start with your questions, um, dive in there. Thank you very much. The, um, the question I have, uh, which is um, packet page 65, for those who are using the packet page, this is 10A, and this is section one, COVID response, mm -hmm. and I'm just gonna read the audit recommendation and then uh, reference the public health response or report. The audit recommendation says, request regular reports from the department outlining what level of staff are diverted to COVID-19 response efforts, and then uh, comma, the effort, the effect, excuse me, that this is having on normal job functions and efforts to mitigate 
excuse me, efforts to migrate services to telehealth. And then uh, in the public health response, I was interested to read a public health report that um, the public health department staff, uh, no public health department staff is currently diverted to COVID-19 or other emergency response efforts. Public Health Department's Emergency Preparedness Program has updated uh, and maintains a Department Operations Center roster, which includes all staff and their potential roles during a public health emergency to facilitate rapid deployment during emergencies, equitable utilization of staff across the department, and advanced training to ensure a prepared workforce. And I may pull Dr. Smith here in, uh, in just a minute. But uh, Dr. Cody, let me ask first, is this specific to public health department as opposed to countywide where we have 23,000 employees uh, or at least positions and um, you know, lots of folks got diverted from their regular duties during the pandemic. So I, I just wanna make sure I know that the focus of this is your department, yes? That's correct. This, this is with regards to our department. And the way um, you will recall, uh, you may recall the very first HHC uh, where we talked about COVID. And at that moment, just public health was um, responding because it, and it, 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 we have this scalable approach. So it starts within the communicable disease group and as resources there are exhausted, it expands to the rest of the infectious disease and response branch. And as those resources are exhausted, it expands to the department. And when the department is exhausted, then we have the County Emergency Operations Center. And that's just how it progressed um, during the pandemic. So this is with regards to the public health department. There are no uh, staff that don't ordinarily work on COVID or communicable disease that are currently working on COVID uh, because it's, um, it's just within the uh, normal operations of the work that we do every day. And uh, am I reading this correctly? If I'm, it, it, it sounds to me as if what has happened here is that having weathered the worst of the pandemic and having returned to a state of normal assignments that you nonetheless said, all right, now that we just went through the pandemic, who needed to do what in the organization that wasn't their regular job? Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that if there's another pandemic, God forbid, next week, next month, next year, we know who's gonna do what and that we have trained them for those duties. Am I reading that correctly? That's right. So there have been a number of, uh, there's been a number of changes <coughs> in the public health department um, since the pandemic, as you might imagine. I would say the most significant of those is that we have built an entirely new branch in the department, which is the science branch. Because during the pandemic, we had to build um, almost overnight the situational awareness branch so that we could collect um, really like, you know, 10 fire hoses worth of data that were blasting at us and try to make sense of it and make policy decisions with it and share it back with the public. We didn't have the infrastructure to do that at the beginning of the pandemic. It was built in the emergency operations center. So what we've essentially done is taken the key parts of that situational awareness branch and made them into a permanent science branch in public health that essentially is like the trunk of our public health tree. Um, and that's entirely new and as a result of what we learned during the pandemic. Also, it's significant in that our infectious disease and response branch, which includes most of the assistant health officers, um, many public health nurses, a lot of subject matter expertise, um, and also the public health preparedness group. That's all in one branch. The branch is generally more robust um, in every way. So it's not to say that if there were another pandemic or when there is another pandemic, that the branch could handle it on its own. We're still gonna need to be able to, you know, expand and scale and bring in other parts of the county. But I think that there are, um, the structure uh, is much more robust to, to be able to um, move things forward. I wanna, uh, I'm gonna try and simplify and hopefully not oversimplify. And 
you know, if I do, again, please clarify or correct as needed, but I'm reading this and hearing you as saying a little different than the piece about, say, the science branch, mm -hmm. that if Sally or Bob used to do this function, and then when all hell breaks loose and there's a pandemic, we need to pivot and have them do that function, that we now have a sort of an organized plan for that pivot in the future, and that Sally and Bob will now be trained for the second function in addition to, at least minimally, in addition to their primary day-to-day -day go to work and do their job function. Did I get that part right still? Yes, so okay. there's two, two parts to that. One is that part of public health preparedness in an incident command system is that you have very specific jobs. And so in our public health, medical health joint operations center or in the county EOC, you, know, you have to have someone who knows how to direct operations, plans, finance, et cetera, et cetera. So we have those roles if we're responding just within our department and people are cross-trained to fill those roles. And it's a bit um, agnostic as to your subject matter expertise. It's your ability to do that job. So that um, we have uh, a bench for each of those positions and people are trained for those positions. But in addition, just the general um, number of people in the department who have relevant subject matter expertise in infectious diseases is greater, right? I mean, that's not to say that we're never gonna have an emergency that is gonna exceed the public health department's capacity uh, because likely we will in the future, but, I, but we are better organized um, to absorb a shock uh, than we were before the pandemic. Thank you, and Dr. Smith, so, uh, and again, correct me if my recollection is wrong, there was a lot of activity, to say the least, uh, during the, the pandemic uh, months and years, but, you know, my recollection is, and a little bit different because it's a separate JPA, but, for example, I think it was something like close to half of the folks in the library JPA got, quote, repurposed or reassigned for COVID-related duties. Am I remembering that more or less correctly? <clears throat> right, that's um, <clears throat> what happened in the library, and we um, also took people as uh, disaster services workers from basically every department. Um, so as I read, um, the Harvey Rose report, I, and I have not talked with them directly, I think they were referring to the countywide effort in addition to the department effort. And as um, Dr. Um, Cody pointed out, during the COVID, we, when COVID was a lot worse, we expanded. And so we had lots of people from other departments working on the response. Um, the last da disaster service workers were sent back to their department some months ago and we scaled back down so that we added more resources to public health, <clears throat> particularly the science branch and we also added some more resources to the Office of Emergency um, Management um, in order to be prepared for the next disaster. But uh, at this point, everybody is doing their regular job and their regular job involves responding to what remains of COVID. And I guess the question I wanted to ask, and thank you for helping me drill down on this is, um, is there anything in the rest of the county system, setting aside the public health department for a minute, that is similar to the work that has been done in the public health department to say, okay, next time there's a pandemic, here's who's going to pivot to do what, and I see Ms. Hansen leaning in as well, here's who's gonna to pivot to do what, and um, let's get them a little cross-trained uh, as I think uh, Dr. Cody referenced a minute ago, either or both. Well, I see um, Greta wants to talk about the clinical operation. I'll talk about finance operation first. Um, 
we still have a lot to do with finance and um, FEMA and emergency uh, reimbursement. Um, that's going to go on for years. Um, and so we have staff that are responding in that way. I'll turn it over to Greta. She has something else to say. Supervisor, I don't know if this is directly um, in the category that you were inquiring about. So I'll, I'll just say briefly a few things, and then um, you can let me know if you'd like to hear more about any of the things I mentioned. But um, consistent with what Dr. Cody was speaking about in terms of investing in an expanded science branch in public health, we've also, as, as you are aware, have um, made significant investments in our language access unit, which is a new unit in the county executive's office that is designed to preserve and expand a set of staff and related resources that we developed as part of our pandemic response that facilitated much more rapid and high quality translation of COVID related materials than were available from just about any county in the United States. And a lot of the materials that we were creating and translating were then used by communities around the country and actually around the world. There was a video that we um, created in, in Vietnamese that I believe became um, one of the most watched COVID prevention related videos in Vietnam itself. Um, so we've uh, invested in that infrastructure to not only support a future emergency response effort related to our multilingual community, but also to um, just improve the quality of the translation work that we do day to day as an organization. And then um, I, I know that there's been some discussion at recent uh, board meetings about the significant investments in expanded emergency preparedness in the health care delivery system, which is something that um, Mr. Lorenz could speak to in greater detail, but everything from ensuring that all of the supplies that we purchased as part of our pandemic response are um, maintained in a, a, a optimal way for accessibility in the event of, say, a large earthquake where we may need to access a lot of emergency medical supplies to expand hospital bed capacity, which we did. Um, in preparation for increased um, uh, hospital utilization and COVID surges to um, just increasing at every level our emergency preparedness in the health system for, um, for all types of disasters, be they um, akin to a pandemic, uh, another pandemic, or an earthquake, uh, a power-related, weather-related event, et cetera. Well, I'm not sure I'm asking my question as clearly, so let me try again. and. Uh inflicted on uh, Mr. Lorenz uh, this time. Mr. Lorenz, um, so we had a COVID clinic uh, for vaccines in, um, we had a couple in Mountain View over the course of the pandemic, one at the community center, uh, one at um, what used to be Joanne Fabrics uh, in uh, uh, Los Altos uh, School District site. Um, there were people who were working at those facilities who clearly didn't used to do that before there was a pandemic, so they got reassigned. Now, some of them were what I'll call healthcare professionals, but I think some of them were not. Am I remembering this correctly? Like somebody was like standing with a clipboard <clears throat> at the front door trying to make sure you got to the right place. Let me, let me try to answer that. Um, when we brought disaster service workers from other parts of the county, obviously they weren't clinicians, so they had to do non-clinical work. So they helped with registration, directing traffic, um, directing people to the right location, moving equipment, all of those non-clinical things. We also hired a number of uh, registry nurses and clinical individuals to actually do the testing and or vaccination. Um, and then we had our own staff also uh, doing, our own clinical staff doing that work as well. So um, I think what you're getting at is that the disaster service workers who are the non-clinicians have now been returned to their regular job Many of the uh, nurses who were brought in from the registry have also 
been returned to their new job. Everybody who's one of our clinical employees continues to do work as assigned, and some of them are assigned to our locations for uh, testing and vaccinations, um, but they're not new responsibilities. They're responsibilities in a different location. Um, I don't know if that gets it. it. It does. What I'm trying to get at is our, so we, and I think I got the clarity I was looking for on the Department of Public Health, but you know, you've got another 20,000-ish people out there, many of whom got um, pulled into serving in uh, the pandemic on duties that were not typically what they had been assigned to. And I, I'm happy to stay in the non-clinical world for just a minute. And so my question is, if there's a pandemic next week, next month, next year, do we know either by job title or code or person's name, Bob, Sally, Sue, Twee, whatever it is, you know, yeah, when we gotta go stand up an emergency vaccination site somewhere, we're gonna take Sally and turn her into the person who directs traffic because we had to figure all this out in real time under the most challenging of circumstances and you know, I know everyone's very serious about making sure that we have these lessons we've learned and that the next time um, we're, we're ready to go, we're not making it up from scratch again the way we had to this time with the first pandemic in, I think, 100 years, if I'm remembering my pandemic history right. Is that helpful in terms of what the question is I'm trying to get to? Yeah, I think I understand. Um, we've done considerable training within the departments and continue to do training within the departments and um, with the Office of Emergency Management to make sure that people are up to speed to be able to respond um, to all types of emergencies. And so um, we don't have a list of names or positions to do particular jobs, but the departments are much more prepared to be able to deal with the concept of using disaster service workers. Well, how, how are we, other than relying on the institutional knowledge of people who are here, you know, some of whom are young enough that they'll be around the next time when there's a pandemic, and some of whom will retire and take their institutional knowledge with them, you know, how, how are we supposed to make sure that Bob, who did a hell of a job directing traffic, um, or being an intake person at the vaccination center is trained and ready to go the next time there's a pandemic. I see Ms. Hansen leaning in. A couple quick, um, quick thoughts on that. Um, one is we do have good records of who served in what capacities as, uh, as DSWs. That's part of the materials that we, that we have to collect also for our FEMA reimbursement. So, we have those records which are managed by the um, personnel unit um, in the Office of Emergency Management that was in place for the pandemic. We also had a lot of folks that I would just mention um, actually transitioned to different roles as part of their work related to the pandemic. Um, everyone from folks who had been uh, hired newly, and uh, Brian Darrow is here, he could speak to this if you were interested in hearing more about it, who were hired into temporary positions, who then stayed on um, in permanent county employment and places where we augmented resources also to have more folks with that training and capacity because there were a lot of realizations we had um, through the pandemic about uh, the need to have staff who were sort of a assigned to more flexible roles in particular places. And then I would also mention the team that's playing a really significant leadership role in um, enhancing our health systems preparedness is a team that originally came together for COVID to do things like stand up our vaccination centers. And so a, a significant number of the staff who really led that effort have stayed together as a team to now lead the work of making the health system um, much more uh, equipped to deal with this type of a circumstance in the future and are also some of the folks who um, 
are maintaining um, for purposes of our health system a lot of the lists of folks um, easily accessible in the event of a disaster with updated contact information who we would pull in immediately if, for example, an earthquake struck tomorrow and we needed to stand up temporary hospital capacity. Yeah, I think what I'll do is, uh, I, I don't want to belabor this uh, anymore today, I'll look to my own staff, uh, Mr. Savage, who I see in the back, and ask him to make sure that our office and I follow up on this. I. Um, Dr. Cody, I feel like I'm at a ping pong or a tennis match here as I pivot back and forth today. But, I, you know, I know you, um, your department was all too aware of the sort of quiet underfunding that had gone on in the public health arena for some years uh, prior to the pandemic. A hundred. And. <laughs> Um, apparently, you have an opinion on this subject, and um, and uh, you know I think uh, at the risk of stating what is now obvious, you know when the emergency is not right there in front of you, there are other pressing matters, and the urgent crowds out the important, and it, you know then all of a sudden you go, why don't we have that infrastructure in place? And what I'm trying to do, Ms. Hansen, uh, is make sure that two years, five years, or ten years from now when the need arises again, if it does, that we don't say, for God's sakes, we went through a pandemic, we learned how to do this, we had people who became very skilled at chores that had not been theirs previously, and why are we trying to figure that out again from scratch, or we don't have the right software, or whatever the thing is. So that's what I would like to sort of pursue and follow up on, because, um, you know, Dr. Cody, you didn't say it, but you inf implied a few minutes ago that it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And, and I just want to make sure that when that time comes, people don't look back and say, what the hell was the matter with those people back in, you know, the year 2022-3, that they didn't realize that they needed to make sure we were ready to go the next time. That's can, I really make, can I make a comment, not a do. detailed comment, but just a broad comment? I've obviously been reflecting quite a lot about our pandemic response and thinking about what made Santa Clara County able to be as nimble and responsive as we were because we were able to do things that other communities weren't. And there's lots and lots and lots of different factors. But one factor, and this may sound a little woo-woo, that I think was actually of central importance was the culture that we have in the county the culture that we have in the county workforce. So, and this is something that Jeff started when he started as county executive, but I felt from the very beginning that other executive leaders in the county absolutely had my back. They had the back of the public health department. They would do whatever it took and they did. And I, so I, I really feel that the culture that's been cultivated in the county made a big, big, big difference. So there's the detailed plans that we have to have and we, they have to be all hazards plans, um, but, but we can't lose that really important secret sauce um, that we had. Well, and on the ground level, um, in terms of, you know, I got, uh, and Ms. Lorenz, I think I shared this with you, I, I certainly hope so, it, you know, I got, uh, almost uniformly rave reviews about the performance of folks at the clinics. And, you know, what I was mindful of while that was happening is, you know, it's not like that was what they were doing last week, last month, last year. And, you know, I'm sure that in an organization this size, there were people who said, that's not my job description. But for the most part, people understood we're the county, we've got a pandemic, it's our job to respond. And if that means you got to do something more, different, then figure it out and get it done. Um, and as I say, I just want to make sure that we don't lose what we created uh, between now and the next time, because, you know, hopefully that'll be a while. So, uh, and it came up actually, not to raise a provocative topic, but when we had the conversation about whether or not, did we end up, Dr. Smith, if you remember, was it $2,500 that was the the bonus pay that we voted on uh, for, I think, you know, all but a relatively small percentage of our county staff. 
Yes. Yeah, and you know, I got, I'll be candidly, I got mixed reaction to that, to be in different parts of my district and talking to people and at sidewalk office hours. And you know, some people were, yeah, sure, fine. Other people were like, well, how can you possibly justify that? And so that, you know, prompted a conversation. And one of the things that I realized people did not realize is that a lot of the way we were able to respond to this was that the people who were getting those, that, you know, $2,500 were people who, thought they were librarians and turned out to be pandemic responders, you know, and um, that I, I, I go back to the librarians because I serve on the library JPA and because it was sort of an easy way for people to understand, no, your, li your librarian helped fight COVID. You kind of need, and, which is not what they thought they signed up to do when they became a librarian. So, all right, enough on that. Any last words here, uh, Supervisor? Right, Lee, nope, you're good. I've exhausted it. All right. Then uh, motion to receive the report. So moved. All right. Then, and I will second uh, with the fair warning that I'll be back on this uh, issue at some point. And that takes us then to uh, item number 11. Uh, and uh, this is the report back on the FDA's final rule on delivery of mammography services. And I had a slightly out of body experience, Mr. Lorenz and Mr. Draper reading about uh, the work that some former state Senator Joe Simidian uh, did more than a decade ago. But uh, who would like to present? I see uh, Mr. Margolin in the chair. Is that the best place to start? Mr. Lorenz? Uh, chair Simidian, uh, Burke, would you like to begin? And then I can. If only we can ma manage the technology here. Here, now it's on. There we go. Uh, would you like me to start? Yes. Uh, yes. So uh, the FDA on March 10th um, provided for this, uh, authorized this final rule on mammography standards, upgrading uh, the, 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 the federal law that's designed to make sure these tests are done on a uniform, high quality basis all across the country. And as you indicated, uh, Mr. Chair, the portion of this regulation that deals with dense breast notification builds on legislation that you authored in California about a decade ago that provided a California version of this notification for women with dense breasts where it's harder for the mammography to identify tumors and there's also a higher risk that you'll have an incidence of, of cancer or a, a malignant tumor. Um, the uh, regulation takes your state law and other states follow your effort and it makes it a, a national standard, a federal standard, with new language, language that's similar to your language, but as, as is indicated in the written report that was in your, in your file, it's a slightly, more, more, a slightly longer, and there's a version for dense breasts and for non-dense breasts, as opposed to your single notification. Um, this um, regulation will take effect September 10th, 2024, but, but when we say take effect, I want, to, I want to clarify one point. That's the date by which every state has to be in full compliance with this new requirement. Uh, if a state is able to act earlier, a state can act earlier, and um, we haven't learned yet what Californians' intentions are in that regard. It's a little bit of a complicated matter to act earlier, may or may not happen, because it requires coordination between the FDA, the California Department of, of Public Health, and the American College of Radiology, all of which have roles to play in regulating um, uh, these uh, imaging centers. Um, uh, as you know, the, the state is responsible for certifying the mammography machines the Department of Public Health under contract with the FDA is responsible for certifying the overall centers and the, the federal government contracts with the American College of Radiology for this uh, certification for the centers and but also contracts with the state to do these annual inspections. So you can see that you've got different players, you have annual inspections and the standards uh, go beyond just uh, dense breasts. There are, in, in the regulation, a whole series of other requirements dealing with issues such as digital mammography technology, 
uh, which uh, regulations updating uh, the requirements to ensure that that's done properly. There are also tougher accreditation standards so that if a facility um, doesn't uh, pass the first accreditation uh, under current regulation, they have multiple opportunities to get accredited. This cr uh, clamps down on that and ensures that if they can't do it after a certain number of times, they cannot be accredited, can't go on endlessly. Uh, there's also FDA authority to directly communicate with patients. There are also our requirements about how these facilities communicate with providers in addition to how they communicate with, um, with, with the patients. And there's, there are also requirements that deal with how uh, the images are to be handled so that they aren't lost or misplaced in the years to come. So it's, it's a complex, multifaceted regulation. Uh, again, um, September 10th, 2024 is the outside deadline for implementation. Uh, and the, the federal government allowed for this 15-month period because they knew that in order to get the different state authorities up to speed, to get the inspectors up to speed, to notify the, the uh, imaging centers and get their procedures um, revised would take some time. So that's a, an overall summary of what the report contains. Mr. Lorenz, do you want to add anything to that? Thank you, uh, Mr. McGollin. So also we have available supervisor, Dr. Jeff Sung, who's the chair of our radiology department diagnostic imaging, and Fong Nguyen, if you have any specific questions. Thank you, and I, I do, and I will in a moment. Let me just first start. I, um, and this is a personal point of view I'm gonna inflict on you all because I can. Um, I, 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 I was never that enthusiastic as a, as a state legislator or as a county supervisor uh, about bragging on we were the first, or we were the most, or we did the, you know, most aggressive this, that, or the other thing. But I am sitting here, uh, both heartened by the progress, but struck by the fact that it it is literally a decade after we made this case in California, and California was not the first. Uh, the legislation that we passed here in California built on legislation that was originally from Connecticut. Uh, where there was an advocate who was able to persuade her state legislators to uh, take this path uh, because we had an initial setback in California with a veto on the first bill. Uh, others uh, stepped in, including uh, New York and uh, Texas. And I remember saying to Governor Brown's office, look, if, if both Rick Perry and Andrew Cuomo are on the same page, maybe we ought to you know, find a way to get to yes on this. But it is, it's a little disheartening that you know, it has taken a decade of activity at you know a number of states' uh, behest to get to this place. Um, now, the the notice is a necessary con precondition to folks then getting the help they need, in my view. But the you know part of what made people nervous all those years ago and uh, is still out there is a uh, concern that, well, you know, if people get the notice, then they are going to suddenly have some interest in, well, what are my other options besides a conventional mammogram, uh, which I want to get to in a minute using the resources that you've just described, Mr. Lorenz. But as it happens, um, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro, who's been pushing on this issue, not coincidentally from Connecticut, where the issue was uh, raised, um, has something called HR 3086, House Resolution, I believe, 3086, which would make the next, take the next step, which is to say that insurers need to actually provide coverage for the uh, other screening technologies that are out there. And um, my understanding is that actually Connecticut did it in the reverse order. They started with the requirement for covering it and then realized guaranteeing people coverage if they didn't know about it was problematic. So the, the notice part came second. In other states, we've gone with notice first uh, and people understood in some cases that that would create pressure for uh, the uh, other screening technologies and you know the potential cost pressure as the folks at the Appropriations Committee, like to call it, would you know would be an issue, but I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Smith uh, and Ms. Hansen if we could have our government relations team take a look at <coughs> um, HR 3086 
and uh, give us an off-agenda report that essentially would identify whether there's any reason we could not, should not take a support position if we haven't already done so under our existing policies. And if, if need sure. be, uh, thank you. And if need be, I'll come back with a referral on that, but I wanna be fully informed before <clears throat> I bring the referral to the full board. And I actually think we've already supported it, but I'll double check. Yeah, and um, then, uh, Who should I be asking to talk to, who should talk to whom at the state level to say, so how's this gonna play out in California? Because initially we had a sunset date, um, and now Mr. McGraw, I'll, I'll complain to you because you're one of the few people who will get what I'm complaining about. We had a sunset date in the legislation to, to prove that the world wouldn't come to an end if we provided this notice. Then when the sunset date arrived, um, folks from the California Medical Association continued to uh, express concern and so the only way that Senator Holly Mitchell, to whom I owe a debt of gratitude, and we all do in my view, um, uh, had to take a second sunset date rather than just put an end to this, okay. The good news is the federal action will precede the second sunset. So presumably that means your, your view is we don't need to worry about extending the California law one more time but we do need to know what's the state gonna do and when they're gonna do it and how they're gonna do it so we know that we're, we're compliant here. So who should talk to whom is my question. Supervisor, um, what I'd like to do is have Dr. Jeff Sung and uh, Dr. Fong Nguyen come online and speak from their association standpoint uh, because one of the things that we have, as you well know, within healthcare, the associations for which many of these requirements would be implemented by. Uh, but I would say we would first start with the association in California um, and work through the appropriate uh, right, legislative. Can we, can we get channels. them online? Let's see if we can make the technology work here. Dr. Sung, if that's you, raise your hand, please. There you go, nice to see you. Anybody else? <coughs> Then uh, let's just re rely on you for the moment, Dr. Sung. Uh, you're our first choice because you're our only choice, sir. So that's, that's how you got that privilege. Um, thoughts about who should be talking to whom at the state level? Well, there's the language that is written within the SB 1538 is very similar to what's within the FDA regulation. Um, I don't know who should be talking to whom uh, at the state level, though I, right now what our plan has been has been to integrate both uh, types of language, both uh, verbiages into our letters to our patients, but just citing the specific um, sources for the language. All right, thank you. Then I think what I'll do, uh, Dr. Smith, is ask administration for a report back uh, off agenda on what the, what the process is going to be for us to discern, learn, acquire knowledge of uh, the state's direction in this area and then make sure that it is incorporated in a timely and appropriate fashion, Dr. Sung. Uh, um, and just because as I say, I um, watching the feds coordinate with 50 different state governments will be an interesting, um, exercise, I think. Then, uh, Dr. Sung, if I may, um, y you know, I, I never anticipated when I went down this path, first in 2011, um, that I would uh, need to learn as much as I did about the various technologies that are used for um, breast cancer screening. And, you know, at the time, one of the things we confronted was, uh, I think some people thought it was an implicit criticism of mammography, which it, I did not think it was. Thought all we were saying is that for a particular group of women and a large group at that, it had its limitations, as do all screenings. Um, but you know, that's when I started to hear about tomography and the thermography and uh, MRIs and um, so on and so forth. Uh, where are we today 
in terms of uh, the range of technologies, um, you know, people still talk about mammography as if it's the sort of daily bread and butter of uh, detection. And, and uh, why don't you just sort of give us a little bit of background on what's out there uh, in the world, uh, and particularly if someone is diagnosed uh, with dense breast tissue, which is a higher risk factor as well as an impediment to uh, identification using conventional mammography. What are our other options these days? Sure. Uh, so in the United States, about 50% of institutions are using mammography as first-line screening, and the other 50% are using digital breast tomography. With digital breast tomography uh, quickly gaining in popularity, and uh, that, that number is certainly going to be changing in the near future. Uh, we ourselves here at BMC are, and uh, SLRH are, have started doing digital breast tomosynthesis at some of our sites for screening of patients and are in the process of implementing that at the rest of our clinics as well as use at our diagnostic machines here at, on the main campus. Uh, the other alternatives to mammography are whole breast ultrasound for dense breasts. Uh, that's a technology we've had for quite some time actually. Um, and the uh, issue with that actually has been related to insurance coverage. It's not covered by a lot of insurances. So it has been uh, not used quite as much. Um, the other options uh, include uh, breast MRI, though that tends to be a costlier option, but is uh, recommended by the American College of Radiology for patients with uh, breast cancer risk of greater than 20% for screening purposes. And then there are some papers on nuclear medicine uh, technologies and thermography, as you mentioned, regarding uh, screening for dense breasts or uh, contrast-enhanced mammography, the, those technologies are less prevalent. I'd say the dominant technology that is building is the digital breast tomosynthesis. Um, and let me try coming at the question this way, which is if we had um, to go back to Mr. Lorenz's term, one of our patients, meaning somebody who got primary care probably at one of our clinics, uh, and uh, was a woman of 45 years old, or, you know, and she said, I guess I should get a mammogram. Is that what she would get typically on an annual basis if she showed up every year and asked for um, a, a screening? Yeah, I think the ideal scenario would be that she would receive a digital a DBT, a digital breast tomosynthesis uh, mammogram. Um, right now, the majority of our clinics are still doing um, full field digital mammography. However, uh, we do have one of our clinics, our downtown clinic, using uh, digital breast tomosynthesis. And and I don't, I don't want to get in it, into it today, but my recollection is that's been a source of some comment from folks, uh, uh, from our, some of our employees. Yes, Mr. Lorenz? Supervisor, you're right. I mean, so we do offer the service, but clearly we all appreciate the fact that having that service available and that technology available at all of our clinic sites for ease of accessibility is important. Um, and that is one of the reasons that we've put forth um, uh, an off-agenda referral uh, report that outlines our plans to implement in, in all of our clinics throughout the system. Uh, Got it. Um, Dr. Sung, uh, you made a passing reference, and I just want to ask you to repeat it because I, I, I heard it, but I didn't fully uh, internalize it. Um, you said you move up to ultrasound under what set of circumstances? <coughs> well, uh, whole breast ultrasound is an option for patients with dense breasts, particularly those with extremely dense breasts. And that's uh, a screening option that's been found to increase sensitivity for breast cancer, though the specificity of it 
uh, is not as high as it is with, with uh, DBT. And so it does lead to additional unnecessary biopsies as the downside of it. But it is an additional option for breast screening. Okay, so now I'm gonna put you on the spot in a good way, which is if you were talking to a layman, which I am, and the layman asked you, well, what's the one thing we could do to make sure we catch more of these cancers earlier, which both benefits the health of the patient and actually ends up costing less given the high cost of dealing with an aggressive case of breast cancer. What is that one thing we could do? And um, <clears throat> not to worry, Dr. Smith has left the room, so you know we won't hear you if it involves cost. <laughs> I th it would be to increase our DBT access, which we're in the process of doing. Okay. And that's uh, a part of the off agenda report that you're referencing, if I remember correctly, Mr. Lorenz. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Um, I think that answers my questions. I do look forward, uh, Ms. Hansen, to making sure that we uh, get clarity around who talks to whom about what at the state level and um, also that as I say, we um, take a look at whether we uh, have any reason why we wouldn't weigh in if we haven't already done so on HR 3086. Supervisor Lee, thanks for your patience. Anything else? Th Dr. Sung, thanks very much. Very helpful and very plain spoken and clear, which I appreciate. Um, like, you, like to Before first. Before you go, though, go, go ahead, Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you. I just certainly want to thank um, uh, former Senator and now Supervisor Holly Mitchell for writing the law in 2018's SB 1034, and also then Senator Semidian for all his great effort uh, on bringing this up. It's a really important issue for so many women in our community, and now this is becoming a, a, a federal law uh, affecting literally um, hundreds of millions of people. So I just want to say thank you for your good work. Thank you. All right, thanks again, Dr. Sung. I'm looking for last comments, if any. If not, uh, let's check online. Do we have anyone who wanted to speak on this item? There are no requests to speak. Then we'll ask uh, for a motion to receive the report and provide the direction as noted. Supervisor Lee, so moved, yes? So moved. Thank you, second, call the roll. Vice Chairperson Lee. Aye. And Chairperson Simidian. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Margolin. Uh, and thank you to uh, Dr. Song and Dr. Uh, uh, excuse me, Mr. Lorenz as well. Thank you. All right, that takes us to item number 12, uh, which is uh, sort of a more comprehensive report. And I know we have uh, a number of slides at PowerPoint here uh, regarding the Navigator program. When we get to uh, Ms. Rava, let's just start with you, uh, Mr. Santiago, and say thank you. Well, thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, Sabidian and Vice Chair uh, Lee, it's, it's been truly a privilege uh, for me to serve this county. As you know, this is my final report, uh, and it's been a tremendous honor for me to work with a team of highly dedicated and highly competent professionals that you see not only in the dais here, but across our health system, doctors, nurses, uh, support teams. Uh, as well as obviously uh, very deeply grateful uh, to Dr. Smith for giving me the, opportun the opportunity to serve this county. Uh, in 2012, uh, there were a lot of questions about whether our health system was going to be able to do well under national health reform. Uh, and it was through a series of uh, very difficult changes, but also in this spirit that uh, Dr. Cody was talking about of, of being mission-driven and value-focused, that we set on this course to not only uh, implement EPIC, uh, which was uh, an investment by our Board of Supervisors in the health system as a state-of-the-art system. We're, you're in short changes. You, you gave us the best. And our teams uh, implemented that very successfully, not only in our hospital, uh, but also across our ambulatory care system. Uh, under your leadership, uh, we've expanded coverage in our communities, uh, so more people have insurance, uh, more people have access to care, 
And of course, uh, we've tackled the difficult, still uh, pending issues related to affordability and removing financial barriers to that care. And I'm glad to report that we're one of the leading counties uh, in terms of the total population that is covered by health insurance or a local program. Uh, we've also led the nation in innovating. Uh, we had the whole person care uh, being born uh, as an idea and concept uh, in this community. And I still remember the, the meeting that Dr. Smith and I took to Sacramento uh, to convince uh, state officials to make whole person care uh, an innovation, a pilot under the 2015 waiver, and we did it successfully, and of course now is translated into enhanced benefits for the Medi-Cal population across the state of California. Through the years, uh, we've grown and expanded our capacity to serve even more uh, uh, residents of our community. And that makes it not only very deeply satisfying, but also uh, tremendously grateful uh, for having served uh, our county well. Of course, challenges still remain going forward. Uh, we're in a much better position and we're trusted hands of not only Mr. James Williams and Greta Hansen and the whole team that you see here uh, that will continue to provide the high level of professionalism that you become accustomed to in terms of your health system. Uh, equity continues to be a big issue for us uh, because we cannot be proud of high quality care. We still have gaps and disparities uh, in terms of very specific populations. It's a high priority, not only for our public health department in terms of strategically, but also in terms of our care delivery. We're still advancing the integration and transformation of our health system. Of course, this is post COVID uh, where the world has changed. And we know, as you just recently stated, there's some private systems that are actually reducing services. Uh, we are seeing across America hospitals closing, uh, but yet here in the county of Santa Clara, under your leadership, we're making investments to ex expand our capacity to serve even more people in the future. So with those departing words, uh, again, I really appreciate everything you have done for, for us and continue to do for our communities and uh, wish you the best uh, as you go forward. Thank you, uh, Mr. Santiago. And I, uh, I should also note, Dr. Smith, I believe this is your last meeting as CEO at our Health and Hospital Committee as well, yes? Yes, both uh, Renee and I are leaving close together. I think he's leaving a week before me. Um, so yes, it is my last meeting. Well, we'll have an opportunity to uh, wish you well at our next board meeting, but as chair of this committee and as a member of this committee for my almost entire time back on the board, I wanna say thank you to you as well as to Mr. Santiago. It's been um, personally quite rewarding for me uh, to have uh, two folks I could turn to before every meeting to make sure that I walked in the door uh, with a clearer understanding of what it was we were about to talk about and most importantly its implications on the people that the five supervisors represent. Um, I think um, not every supervisor in every county in this state could um, expect uh, to have that resource uh, readily at hand and it has I think really um, been an important part of our board's ability and my ability as an individual supervisor to move forward the kind of agenda that you described, uh, Mr. Santiago. I, um, I, I, uh, I'm not shy about uh, asking for what I think the folks in our community and in my district need and deserve, uh, and I am, um, always frustrated when the system does not move as quickly as I hope it would uh, or believe it should. But the one thing I have to say, and I think it's important to say by way of thanks to both you, Mr. Santiago, and you, Dr. Smith, is whenever I have said we need to be doing more for more people, you have found a way to say, let's figure out how we can do that.
and this again goes back to your comments, Mr. Santiago. I just, um, you know, ours is an imperfect organization, as every organization is. Uh, but whenever uh, there has been an exhortation to find a way to do more for more people, um, this is a county, and you two are county leaders who have said, yeah, let's figure out how we can make that happen. So um, thank you for that. Uh, I am guessing that um, when you have a few spare moments after you step away from 70 West Heading Street, you'll be looking back on your careers in public service and uh, anticipating what comes next. Uh, and uh, obviously, I wish you well. We wish you well on the what comes next part. But I hope you will take some great satisfaction in the... Um, work you have been doing in the decade that I've been privileged to work with you both to always find a way to do more. I, I think it's um, it's not all that common an inclination uh, among uh, folks in public service sometimes. So thank you for that both. Um, Mr. Santiago, back to work is, uh, well, uh, before I get to uh, Supervisor Lee here in a minute, is there anything else you would like to share under your director's report at this, your very last HHC meeting? No, that, that concludes my remarks, and unless you have any other questions. Let me turn then to Supervisor Lee, uh, and we will then march through the uh, entire team here. Thank you. Certainly, I want to echo all the comments uh, from uh, Chair Samidian on this, uh, and you know, both Renee and Jeff here are truly class acts, and we're very fortunate to have you both uh, serve us, and uh, you really care about our every resident. Uh, and as we said, uh, equity is really in the heart of our diverse community, and I really just want to thank uh, both of you for all those uh, great work. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just turn back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, public health, would you like a second bite at the apple? No, I think we've said all we need to say. All Thank right. Uh, Valley Medical Center, Mr. Lorenz. Thank you, Chair Samidian. I just have to take this opportunity for the record and really express uh, my appreciation uh, for Rene Santiago and his support. Um, he allowed me to, to lead um, you know, allowed me to represent the organization, and so. Thank you very much. And, of course, to Dr. Smith, thank you. It's for the record, Jeff. <laughs> I have to look back, you know, when I get to retire someday in the future and know that I had a chance to work with you. Uh... Thank you, Mr. Lorenz, and uh, Supervisor Lee, I'll, uh, of course, uh, if you lean in on any of these items, I'd be happy to uh, hear your comments or questions. Behavioral health, um, let's go to Mr. Rao. Sure, um, we do have a brief update on the Navigator program, but I'm not sure if you prefer to ask questions or... Um... Why don't we do it this way? How about if I ask you some questions and then if there's anything I didn't ask that you want to share, you share it. Is that okay? We actually have some members from our team who um, oversee our behavioral health navigator program Great. here today. Great. Come on down, as I they say in that. game show land. <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. Uh, I am, of course, pleased about the um, progress the navigator program has uh, made. I do have one sort of generic question, but I want to let you introduce yourself for the record first, and you're going to have to see if you can solve the mystery of those microphones. Hello. You win a prize, good for you. Introduce yourself for the record, please, even if we know who you are. <laughs> Hi everyone, Alicia Muskies, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a PM3 in behavioral health. Nice and how do you pronounce your last name correctly again, please? Muskies, uh, like a moose on skis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We will never forget your name now, Ms. Muskies. Um, I, uh, we have the PowerPoint presentation, and there are a number of indicators uh, in uh, the materials we have uh, showing, I'll call it satisfaction levels in the 90 plus. 
I don't know enough about this kind of assessment to know whether I should say, as I'm inclined to, gee, it looks like people are finding this pretty good and it, like it's working well, or whether the only people who ever comment are people who are you know, gonna be happy with the service and that's why they comment. So do we know from comparisons to other similar studies in other programs or services, are these numbers, you know, as good as they look or should we take them, you know, uh, as good news but with a little bit of grain of salt? Any, any ability to tell us? And if the answer is, who knows? That's a fair answer, I guess. I was told by Qualtrics um, who, this is all, you know, their, their system uh, that these are very high scores, especially for a public agency, and we should be very proud. All right, thank you. That you, uh, I, did, I honestly didn't know the answer, obviously, and I was curious to know uh, whether we were um, justifiably enthusiastic about these or whether that's just sort of what you get when you ask. Um, let me then ask, uh, we've got some expansion in the North County and the West Valley, about which I'm personally quite pleased as the District 5 supervisor. Uh, can you tell us what's happening and what the timeline is? I'm thinking about Los Gatos Library. I'm thinking about West Valley Community Services. I'm thinking about the Mountain View Library. I'm thinking about the Palo Alto Courthouse and anything else you'd like to tell us. Sure. Um, we have begun at the Palo Alto Courthouse. Um, that happened about two weeks ago. They were the very first location in person. So we're there once a week. Um, and then we are at all locations once a week, half a day for now because of the staffing that we have. And we'll also see how things go. And if there's additional need, you know, we can look at seeking additional support. Um, the Los Gatos Library, West Valley Community Services, Community Service Agency, and Sunnyvale, there's three that all have the name Community Service Agency in the title. Um, so Cupertino, Sunnyvale, and Mountain View, right? Um, all different agencies, but all three of them are starting this week, as is Los Gatos Library, so those four. And again, they're about three to four hours a day, once a week. And for Los Gatos Library, we did meet with the um, Adult Rec Center. They're, you know, neighbors, as we discussed, I think, at the board meeting last time. So they're enthusiastic about referring folks you know, just to walk on over across the sidewalk to see our navigators in person at the library. And is most of the work um, in person as opposed to telephone or online? Uh, um, if somebody uh, calls, is there, I mean, can they? Well, those are the locations where one of the navigators will be in person. But in addition, the, you know, the phone is the primary method that has been used for the Navigator program, and that will remain Monday through Friday, eight to five. It's the okay. same you know, behavioral health call center number, but we're option four. So the notion is the, the previous delivery model remains, is still available for people, but to add one more way to connect with folks, they can now come meet with somebody in person uh, you know, in that band of availability that's specific to each location. Okay. Correct. Um, and how are we letting folks know about all that uh, good work and availability and that resource? We did uh, create, well, so we have an updated program flyer and all of the um, information will be on the website because we imagine that the schedule will increase over time, that locations will increase. Um, but in addition, we made site-specific flyers for each of the sites, and they will be, I think, giving those out quite, you know, quite a lot. But we also have, I, I believe you might remember from a previous report, an outreach grant that we got from Kaiser. So we have an outreach worker who is a Valley Health Foundation employee, and so they go to outreach events where they promote the program, and they'll be promoting the new schedule, too. Okay. Um, I, I know you've been in touch uh, with the various offices, uh, but I want to make sure, Ms. Muskies, that you see uh, Matt Savage, who's sitting in the back row from my office. Thank you for waving at each other. Uh, we'd like to follow up with you about some of the outreach efforts and try, particularly since this availability is a new phenomenon, to make sure that folks in the 
north and western part of the county are aware of the availability of the service. Okay. Yeah, definitely. We are. We have sent the new flyers to the print shop, so when they arrive, we'll definitely give you hard copies. It'd be great to have your support at the farmers markets, etc. And we're just waiting on final review from all of the community partners because we have their logos, et cetera, on those flyers. So they're just confirming it's the correct logo. It's, you know, they're good with it. And then we'll definitely circulate them to a wide audience, including y'all. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And Mr. Ralph, I want to pivot to the trust expansion. Do we bring in a different member of the team? Uh, no, I, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have All related right. to Ms. Muskies, trust thanks. Expansion. I Thank you, uh, think we're good. Mr. Rao, uh, I'm just curious about the trust expansion, which I think is uh, um, now funded as of July 1, coming where, when? Yes, correct. Um, our contract uh, will be executed effective July 1st, um, and we expect that within three months we will have uh, trained and hired a uh, staff and we um, expect an end of September launch for the West Valley expansion of trust um, and the contract is with uh, Pacific clinics who will be providing those services I won't I won't do a pop quiz and ask you to tell me all of Pacific clinics prior names I'll let that go okay, for now thank you, all Supervisor. Right. Uh, that's all I I have for behavioral health Supervisor Lee you good to go okay thank you sir Thank you again, Ms. Muskies. If you haven't already vacated the premises, there you are. Um, and uh, that takes us then, I believe, to the Valley Health Plan. Thank you, Chair Simidian. Um, you have our report. I'm happy to answer any questions. I also would like to express my gratitude to Renee for all his support and guidance over the five years I've been here. It was really invaluable, and I will miss you. Um, you can point me towards somebody else if it if it makes sense but and maybe we bring Mr. Santiago back in the conversation but so we've been reading a lot in the newspapers and we've been talking in this committee about the need for um, Medi-Cal beneficiaries to be quote recertified mm -hmm. how's that affecting your world if it is so um, we're working um, both um, our team in terms of the business development office has been working with Santa Clara Family Health Plan and BMC and our other county partners, including the clinics, um, to be part of the redetermination. Santa Clara Family Health Plan obviously is the recipient of the data directly from the state. And those uh, anyone who's unenrolled out of Medi-Cal will go into the lowest cost bronze, uh, silver plan rather, in our county, which is Valley Health Plan. Uh, we are the lowest cost silver plan. So we expect we're going to see an increase in those enrolled in the silver plan. Do we chase them, and I mean that of course in the best way, do we chase them to see if they really are eligible for Medi-Cal even if they've fallen out of the program? Um, well, so they should, the state should review them. What I think the, the challenge for us will be reaching out to them and hoping that the information we're getting from the state is accurate, obviously, so that we can have that conversation, ensuring that they understand Covered California. You know, health insurance is complicated, and they've just suddenly become Covered California members. They're going to need some support. We're going to give you the award for the understatement yes, of the day. absolutely. Uh, so. and, <laughs> but they will need some support and outreach from us, and that's what we're planning to do, um, to make sure that they pay their next premium when it comes due. So that's probably our biggest concern at this point. Thank you, Mr. Santiago. I saw you leaning in and your light go on. No, absolutely. I think uh, uh, Ms. Rosa has described it accurately. We're, we're engaging a variety of stakeholders as well as social services agency. And the state does have a single entry point for both uh, Medi-Cal and Cover California. So uh, hopefully uh, that will work. What's going to be telling is beginning this month, uh, they're starting the redetermination process, uh, even though they had been outreach before. Uh, beginning July 1st, that's when they began, the state and social services began to take action uh, related to the eligibility. And so therefore, in August, um, you should be seeing some of the reports uh, flowing through social services and our own health system in terms of what are going to be the local impacts. As you know, the, the headlines are not good nationally. Uh, there's, there's headlines about almost a million people already uh, losing uh, Medicaid, Medicaid coverage across uh, the U.S. 
with a variety of different disparities in different states, depending how the states roll out the eligibility determination process. So we're hopeful here in the state of California with all the progress that we made, uh, that it's not gonna be as negative impact, but uh, Ms. Rosas does say there'll be options for people if they're not eligible for Medi-Cal to obviously uh, be available through Cover California and the Silver Plan, which is the most affordable. Thank you for that uh, from both of you. Before I go on to Ms. Lowther, I realized I was remiss. Hey, Mr. Lorenz, I, I, didn't, I didn't hear you lean in and, you know, bask in the fact that we've hit 1,000 participants in the Medicist program. So thank you for that continued effort. Uh, I need to say that again. Thank you for that continued effort. It, um, for those of you who wonder what we're talking about, this is the Medicis program that helps subsidize the cost of life essential medications that are particularly expensive. Folks who, um, who absolutely require uh, diabetes medication, including but not limited to insulin, or an EpiPen for uh, you know potential anaphylactic shock, or an inhaler for asthma. And um, you know when we launched this program, candidly. The take up was unimpressive to dismal, uh, in my characterization at least. And um, we tried a couple of different things and they didn't work. And to the credit of the organization, they said, we're going to keep trying until we find the right formula. And apparently we found the right formula. And, you know, now we've got a thousand folks who are living a somewhat better life. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've integrated not just the cost reduction, but the medication adherence program, which I know was important to our clinical staff. Uh, I, I kept talking about money and they kept talking about health and, you know, you managed to find a way to do both. So thank you on that front and forgive me for uh, skipping over you earlier on that one because it's, um, it's a nice success story that you should take a little satisfaction in. And please share that. Thank you with folks in the pharmacy and others who've been participating. I will, Supervisor, and I just want to thank you for your persistence uh, in making sure that we were putting together a program that really addressed barriers to access. So, thank you. Thank you. All right, on to EMS, and our numbers look better? Yes? A little bit. For this last month, uh, for May uh, or April, all compliance, both for first responders and AMR. Uh, staffing is still a challenge for them, but in my report I put in the pipeline there's about 56 EMTs, paramedics going through uh, to be ready between now and sort of the end of the summer. So it is getting there, but it is very, very slow. And volume for June has been a little less than it was. It was the second highest month for May. So everybody can take a deep breath and enjoy the weather. All right, well, thank you here again. I, you know, I think uh, before you can solve the problem, you have to acknowledge the problem. And I think, you know, we just need to say, it's a challenge, it's a problem and we're gonna fix it. So thank you for staying on it. And um, uh, you didn't say it uh, quite this directly, but I will, we're gonna have to stay on it if we don't want the problem to recur. So thank you for that. I do. And uh, that takes us to Custody Health, Dr. Day. Good afternoon, supervisors. And just wanted to note that the face of the report that we will be submitting to Health and Hospital Committee on a go-forward basis will be changing because we are stopping our COVID-19 activities as far as testing uh, with staff and some of the protocols that we have with our patients. And so we're pretty pleased to say that with a patient census of today at 2,998, uh, we have zero cases of COVID in the jails and in the juvenile setting. So we're pretty proud of that number. And I also would like to take an opportunity to thank Renee and acknowledge you with gratitude, Renee, for your sponsorship and support. It's been a pleasure working with you and helping drive the relevance of custody health services as a vital part of the health and hospital system in Santa Clara County. Thank you. Thank you, and Dr. Day, I don't think I had the opportunity when we were making our way through that very um, disheartening report on the Nunez case to say, um, you know, I shouldn't second guess your thoughts or your feelings, but I'm guessing at the end of the day, you sometimes wonder, does anybody understand the magnitude of the challenge for which you are responsible? And I wanted to let you know that 
Uh, there are those of us on the board who do understand the magnitude of the challenge that you faced, and we appreciate the fact that you've stepped up in a way that has been um, really noteworthy and uh, overdue. So um, if you wonder if anybody notices, yeah, they do. <laughs> Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank, Thank you, you for the work, seriously. All right. We have a question from Supervisor Lee. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, quick question, Dr. Day. Thanks for the uh, report and the uh, standing up this discharge clerk program. That's certainly something that is uh, truly needed, and I'm glad it's now operational. I guess that my uh, other question is what type of follow-up we could do once the uh, patients are now in the community after discharge? Uh, how do we have a handoff after the discharge clerk has provided the medications and whatnot to those who have been discharged to make sure that they do receive these uh, services? Uh, sure, and we did report on that today in P uh, PGSC. Uh, but also, with the discharge clerk, this is an early program. It's still in its infancy. We're coming up on one year in June, actually this month. And so what we're doing now is the uh, discharge clerks meet face-to-face -face with the patients. We have intentionally worked with our custody bureau colleagues and have co-located our clerks aside uh, as the patients are being released. And so what they do is they get an entire packet for discharge. We also get their AVS, uh, which is their discharge summary. And that discharge summary has all of the information that they need as far as is any uh, follow-up on labs and appointments, uh, medications, that type of thing. Uh, some of the patients, if they're planned discharges, we do have appointments set up in the community. We work with a lot of our community providers, as well as very closely with um, Gabby's group in behavioral health services. And so those uh, patients are um, pretty well set with appointments and follow-up. And so um, that's pretty much what we're doing. And once they go into the community, however, um, our jurisdiction for the most part stops. Uh, however, we do, we are contacted for continued information and or for any kind of release of information of records. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Day. Thank you. That takes us to 12H, which is the uh, report from Mr. Margolin, uh, relating to federal health policy and budget matters. Mr. Margolin, what should we know? Well, the main thing to know is that the major issue in Washington now is getting a bipartisan deal on funding the government for 2024. That's the major issue. Following the debt ceiling deal, there was an expectation that there would be a return to regular order. There was a commitment by the major parties to do all 12 appropriations bills in the normal sequence and uh, a commitment also to uh, avoid a government shutdown if at all possible. So for a brief period of time, there was an expectation of a relatively smooth, not perfectly smooth, but a relatively smooth process. Um, that um, expectation faded rather quickly when 11 uh, House Republicans decided to capture the House floor, reject any and all rules coming from the Rules Committee that would allow for the consideration of bills, and by freezing action on the House floor, essentially expressed their dissatisfaction with the deal that Speaker McCarthy cut with, with the President. Um, that freeze lasted for several days. Ultimately, it's been at least temporarily um, put, put aside, but as a consequence of that freeze in part, uh, Speaker McCarthy and the House Appropriations Committee has decided to move back in, in the appropriations process to the 2022 spending levels. The deal with the White House was for 2024, we're going to keep the 2023 levels, we'll freeze them, and that was bad enough because there's a, a loss of inflation. But the original House proposal last spring was to go back to 2022, a draconian level of cutback. And now the House appropriators, I'm sure in response in part to f pressure from the House Freedom Caucus and that display on the House floor, they've begun the process of approving appropriations bills at the 2022 level. What does that mean? It means that there's a difference of uh, over $120 billion between what the Senate is doing and what the House is attempting to do. It means that um, the House Appropriations Committee actually put out a list of, by agency and department, the level of cuts that would be required. And for labor HHS appropriations for that bill, uh, they're talking about a 29% cut for interior environment. They're talking about a 35% cut. 
These are obviously unrealistic numbers. The Senate will never agree to them. The President will never agree to them. There's a larger issue here also about what some are calling a lack of good faith because a deal was cut. How can you go back to your 2022 numbers the way the House Republicans are attempting to rationalize it is they're saying, well, that number was a ceiling. It wasn't the deal point. And of course, we all know how illogical that position is. You strike a deal, uh, we want 100, you want 75, we agree on 85. It's 85 then, it isn't back to 75. So um, it's a non-starter. It raises the issue uh, of a um, government shutdown in September or certainly a continuing resolution for a period of time. This affects all the health funding issues we're tracking, the effort to get the dish cuts deferred, expansion of community health center funding, all the various behavioral health bills. Not that they can't get acted on by the end of the year, some of them at least, but no one's gonna be serious about getting any of these other health funding bills approved and through until the larger funding levels and the larger appropriations uh, bills are approved. Uh, the one last thing I'll say is there is one kicker here that ultimately suggests that there will be 12 appropriation bills passed because part of that deal, the debt ceiling, was a penalty if by the end of the year all 12 bills weren't approved. Uh, the, by the second quarter of next year, there's a 1% across the board cut, which includes defense, which was scheduled for a 3% increase, so 1% cut means defense is cut by 4%. Senate Republicans and even um, House Republicans will probably in the end not tolerate that level of reduction. So there'll be a deal in the end, but there could in October be a government shutdown, there could be a continuing resolution for a period of time and kind of a mess. So that's, that's my report, that's where we are, unfortunately. I'm tempted to ask that next time we agendize your report is the never a dull moment uh, report because it seems like there's never a dull. I, so uh, you anticipated the two questions I had, which is, um, did the would the White House uh, perceive this or characterize this as a breach of the deal, uh, demonstration of bad faith? And it sounds like the answer to that is pretty clearly yes. What I would say is that House Democrats are saying that explicitly. The Biden administration, for obvious reasons of wanting to continue to negotiate with the speaker, are I'm sure thinking that privately, but not expressing it publicly. But it. House Democrats are very clear this this bridges this breaches the deal. And the other other question I had was what about the sort of built in protection that you had shared with us previously, which was the across the board cuts that were anathema to many in the Republican it, conference. It, it, it's, still the, it's still there, but again, because they don't kick in until the second quarter of 2024, and because you can go till the end of this year, it allows for three months of continuing resolution, chaos, and negotiation before they kick in. So it could get worse before it gets better, is yes. that a, okay? Yes. All right. Uh, Supervisor Lee, questions, comments, if any? Yes, thank you, Mr. McGoland, uh, for the uh, update, uh, certainly very disappointing to know how 11 individuals could basically hold the whole country hostage. Uh, in this case, and certainly that that's no democracy. Uh, it's not a majority rule, not even a minority in this case. Um, when is Congress going to be in recess? Because obviously we have so little time between now and the end of fiscal year of September 30th. We're already close to the end of June. I believe they take at least a month or two off in the summer. They do. I don't have the exact dates in my head right now, but they definitely will have a July 4th recess. They have an August recess. Typically, they're, they're several weeks off. So they're going to be gone part of the time. The real issue here, you mentioned democracy. So in theory, there is, there are more than enough votes to get all this done, but if you add Democrats to the more reasonable Republicans, the problem, the reason why these 11 members have leverage, as you could under, easily understand, is the motion to vacate. So if Speaker McCarthy says, I can't stop governance, we have to have a budget, uh, and he moves ahead with a Democrat-Republican coalition, a little bit like the way the debt limit deal was done, those 11 Republicans could say, move to vacate the chair. And then, of course, it's up to Democrats as to whether or not they want to save the speaker or not, and it gets very complicated for Speaker McCarthy. So it's really the threat to vacate that keeps McCarthy from doing the logical thing, which he may have to do in the end. He may have to do this, put together a Democrat-Republican bill like with the debt ceiling. 
When you say motion to vacate, meaning that we're going to challenge whether McCarthy is going to be even the speaker. Correct. Which means without 11 votes, without Democratic support, McCarthy will no longer be speaker. That is correct. That's the threat. That is the threat. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else at this point, Mr. Margolin? Uh, no, I'd just like to express my own appreciation to uh, Mr. Santiago. He and I have worked together f uh, for many, many years, actually preceding my time here uh, with Santa Clara County when I was working in Los Angeles on the LA County waiver. Uh, Renee was a, a key part of that team and uh, did a phenomenal job in managing the waiver process for Los Angeles County, and he's done an incredible job during his decade here. And uh, to sort of pick up on a theme that was expressed earlier on, and it's true really of this county and the culture I've experienced here in general, this is one of the few counties I'm perhaps uh, willing to assert it's maybe the only county in California where the premise when it comes to health care and social services and the safety net, the premise is always let's do more. That doesn't exist anywhere else in the state in my experience, and it's been a pleasure working with Renee in pursuit of those goals over the last uh, many years and wish him the best of luck going forward. What a great moment to say, without objection and hearing none, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.